Valley Vale 500 is underway. The 30 cars stream through turns number one and two. Two abreast and Bill Elliott has dropped back slightly as up front it is Harry Gann and Bobby Allison leading the way toward lap number one. single file now through these 35 degrees of banking. Harry Gant and Bobby Allison up front, followed by Neil Bonnet, then Terry Labonte, Lake Speed, Ron Bouchard, Ricky Rudd, and Bill Elliott. Elliott with a not too good a start. He did lose a couple of positions on the start, but now is hanging up there in eighth position. Lap number three is about to be complete. They continue to run in the same order. Dale Earnhardt looks like he's on the one back in the back. Harry Gant, Bobby Allison is really hanging. This is one of the better qualifying efforts for Bobby Allison in the last couple of years. Started outside pole, so. There is Dale Earnhardt running right behind Jeff Bodine, and Earnhardt was taking the high line last lap around, but now he's settled in behind Jeff Bodine, running ahead of Kyle Petty out there on the racetrack. Dale Earnhardt, who started in 12th position in the Wrangler Chevrolet car number three. There you can see him using a slightly higher line than most of the other drivers. He tried to bring the car down off of the fourth corner and get underneath Jeff Bodine that time, but it didn't work. He is running in 11th position. Jeff Bodine in car number five is running in 10th spot. They battle through turns number three and four. There's the leader. It continues to be Harry Gant and Bobby Allison following very closely. Then there are six or seven or eight car lengths before we get back to the third place competitor. That is Neil Bonnet. And Daryl Waltrip begins to move as he also has chosen to use a slightly higher line. There he goes to the outside of Ricky Rudd and Ron Bouchard. And you can see the tire, the right rear tire smoking on the Waltrip car. As he begins to move up and Lake Speed is sideways in turn number three. And this is going to be a multi-car accident. At least three cars are involved. Terry Labonte spins down the front stretch as Lake Speed, Daryl Waltrip, and Ron Bouchard have all suffered body damage. And Lake Speed is beginning now to move away in turn number four. Daryl Waltrip has moved into the pit area. And everybody else is out on the racetrack, but a lot of debris down there in turn number four. It's going to be interesting to see if we lose any cars because of this accident. Daryl Waltrip's left front end is damaged rather badly. You can see the damage there as the crew begins to go to the car and to try to straighten the body damage out. And Bill Elliott is also in the pits, as is Terry Labonte and Ron Bouchard. Here's Jack Aru. Well, the damage on Daryl Walters' Budweiser Chevrolet is extensive. The crew is going to the front of the car for first, and they're trying to pry out a flat tire on the left side, and all of the fender wells are caved in. Meanwhile, Junior Johnson is working vigorously on the back side. He's got that straightened away. But it is a tough break, and I'm going to see if I can step in and get a quick word from Daryl Waltrip. Daryl, what happened? I don't know, Jackie. Uh, Lake speed, somebody hit him, got him crossed up, and I couldn't see from the smoke. Well, that's the word here from Darrell Walters' pit, and they're continuing to work figure furiously, but the problem is going to be they're going to lose precious laps, and it could be Duke Fini for another victory for the Walter team. Well, he's not the only one that suffered a lot of body damage. The Ron Bouchard car, Ron Bouchard car is also heavily damaged in the front end. So with nine laps completed, we have our first yellow of the afternoon. And the start of today's NASCAR Valley Nail 500 has been brought to you by Coney, makers of shock absorbers and suspension kits for all performance cars. Coney, proven superior. We'll be back with more from the Valley Nail 500 from Bristol Raceway in just a moment.
back at Bristol where we are under yellow because of an accident up in turn number four and this is what happened as Lake Speed is sideways in turn three. And you can see him clip Terry Labonte and there is no place for Ron Bouchard or Daryl Waltrip to go and Bill Elliott was also involved in that Benny and I don't know who he hit but he is still in the pit area and they had the hood up in that car. I guess that he ran in the back of someone when they started slowing down for the accident. You know and it looked like Lake Speed was going to come down the racetrack that Daryl Waltrip and Ron Bouchard were both going to get by on the outside but he did not. I, I find out someone told me one of our spotters told me that Bill Elliott hit Ron Bouchard. Jackie Root is down with Bill Elliott. Jackie. And the window net is and the window net is still up on the course Thunderbird but I can get a word with Bill Elliott. Bill you're replacing a radiator. Do you know who you hit. I don't know. He had somebody in the back. The lights fade spot out. I don't know what happened from there. So this kind of cuts you out of the chance of winning the race. Now do you just do you stroke it for the rest of the day. I got here a word. In a well it's obvious that the race has gone back to green. Let's go upstairs. Indeed it has. And Harry Gant continues to lead. Bobby Allison running second and Neil Bonnet is third with Tim Richmond now in fifth position. Laps and six cars lost laps because of that accident up there in turn number three. Namely Daryl Waltrip, also Dale Earnhardt, Lake Speed. And I believe Bill Elliott, of course, who is still in the pit, also lost the lap because of the accident. I'm surprised with the way Bobby Austin is running today, Bob. He really got the thing hooked up. And looks like he uh, Harry Gant did a good job to jump a moment ago on the restart, but Harry is uh, Bobby Austin is right behind him. I stand corrected. Dale Earnhardt did not lose a lap on that. Uh, particular yellow flag he is running in sixth position but Darrell Waltrip has lost at least three laps and Lake Speed has lost at least one and Bill Elliott is still in the pit area as you heard him tell Jackie and Ruth they are changing a radiator on that car so it's basically a two car race at this point Harry Gant and Bobby Allison showing the way good race also back in third position as Neil Bonnet and Tim Richmond are running right together on the racetrack as are Harry Gant and Bobby Allison. Yeah. Harry Gant currently running in uh, seventh position in the point standings for the Grand National Division as we go back and check on that battle for third and fourth place. There it is Neil Bonnet and Tim Richmond. It looks like that Neil Bonnet has been holding up Tim Richmond for the last few laps because in the corner Richmond's been going up and bumping him. As we can see as they come off turn four, Bob, he's right on his bumper. And I think that Richmond could run faster if he were in front. But Neil Bonnet's in front, he's going to stay there. Now Earnhardt is on alongside Richmond. And as we watch the action on the racetrack, Bill Elliott pulls out of the pits and gets back out there on the racetrack. But obviously his chances of winning this race are virtually gone. Allison keeping a close watch on Harry Gant now Bobby moves up on the racetrack to see if he can pass Harry Gant but cannot do so but now Allison moves to the outside in turn number three and they're side by side as they come through the fourth turn and Bobby Allison is going to take the lead on lap number 21 Allison passes Gant for the lead here's Larry Newber. A lot of disappointment in the Lake Speed pit on two separate occasions, Bob and Benny. He just barely did not make it out while they were being repaired under the caution flag. He lost two laps and they didn't expect it. Also, the new tire rule. Perry Labonte at number 34 had a flat tire under the yellow flag, so he had to make one extra pit stop also. All right, Bobby Allison leading now. Terry Labonte is going to be making another pit stop. Ron Bouchard running very slowly on the racetrack. That car damaged in the incident up in turn number three. Bobby Allison begins to lap some of the slower cars passing the Chrysler product. That's owned by Arrington Racing and driven this weekend by Phil Good from Martinsville, Virginia. That was a great move by Bobby Allison a moment ago, Bob, to pass Harry going into third corner on the outside. That shows just how well Harry Bobby Allison is working right now, and he's driving away. And the race for third position now involves Dale Earnhardt and Neil Bonnet and Earnhardt sneaks to the inside and so does Tim Richmond. So both of those drivers <laughs> pass Neil Bonnet. Oh, Neil Bonnet didn't want to play with that crowd. I tell you that. We will 
you'll notice throughout the afternoon Benny and we'll comment on this uh, here in the early stages of the race we will notice that smoke comes from the right rear tire of some of the cars is that necessarily an indication that they're not handling right they're going into turn so hard and the tires are just sliding across the racetrack slightly enough to make the tire smoke. The new sealer is letting the cars go through the turns much faster and therefore we're just sliding a little bit and that's where the smoke's coming from. I don't think it's going to hurt anything. Hopefully it is going to, they aren't going to have any tire trouble in it. Dale Earnhardt now begins to move on in on second place, Harry Gant. There is Gant, there is Earnhardt and right behind Earnhardt is Tim Richmond. And we have been uh, notified that Terry Labonte has been penalized two laps because he has three tires under the caution. And of course, the new rule from NASCAR this year is that when there is a caution on the racetrack, you can only change two tires. And Terry changed three, as Larry Newber indicated a little bit earlier, so he has been penalized two laps. Dale Earnhardt went right by Harry again down the first second corner. We see Tim Richmond going by him as well. Harry is having to go up the racetrack down in turns one and two. Neil, Dale Earnhardt and Tim Richmond stand on the bottom of the racetrack, have taken second and third. So Dale Earnhardt, who started this race in 12th position, has moved up to second spot already and looking very fast in that Wrangler Chevrolet. Dale Earnhardt from Kannapolis, North Carolina. There's the battle for third place involving Harry Gant and Tim Richmond. It's been a good ride so far in the early stages of the race for Tim Richmond, who now moves to the inside and passes Harry Gant and goes into third. And now Neil Bonnet also to the inside of the race track underneath Harry Gant. And he's in four spot. Harry drops from first to fifth. And let's go down to Jackie Arun, who is with Dale Inman. Dale Lindman, Dale Lindman, what was the problem? You've got two lap penalties from NASCAR. Well, it was fun, Jockey, and uh, we changed right side tires. We had a left side down. And the same thing I had to do as Atlanta. We had to run two laps. So when we were going to change tires, we lost two laps under the caution changing tires. Does that make you in favor or against the new tire? Well, I certainly don't like it right now. <laughs> That's the word here, back up to the tower. Well, it's a rule that everybody has to uh, get along with, and sometimes it works to your advantage, and sometimes it works to your disadvantage. It certainly hasn't worked for Terry Labonte's in the last couple of races, that's for sure. Last in uh, Atlanta, he did not stop and change the tire and stopped on the green. He lost two laps. Today, they just chose to go ahead and take the two-lap penalty and start the race, start back the race. And oh. we have a problem up in turn number three. Several cars are involved in this one. Joe Rutman hits the wall very hard in the rear end, also involved. Jeff Bodine, Neil Bonnet, Tim Richmond, Harry Gant, and I believe also that's Joe Rutman who's pulling away. So there are the cars of Tim Richmond and Neil Bonnet that are stalled down in turn number four. And there is Joe Rutman coming into the pits, and Joe is running very well. A lot of sheet metal damaged here. That Harry Gant's car is also badly damaged. I don't know. I think Joe Rutman should stop that car because there's a lot of smoke pouring from it. It's coming, it looks like, from the uh, cockpit of the race car. Too. It really does. Uh, I think it's tire smoke, but there's no way of really being sure. Well, he's staying out there and completing another lap. There's Neil Bonnet's stalled car down in turn number four. And Tim Richmond is also stalled down there. So some excitement here in the first 36 laps of this race as we've had two uh, rather serious crashes that have eliminated the chances of winning of several top contenders. Back with more of the Valleydale 500 from Bristol in a moment. I'm telling you, they hit that fence. Okay. He hit that fence, Jenkins. Them Rutman hit really that. hit it hard. It looked like 27 blue going in the corner. And Is that, all, yeah. I mean, Rutman really backed Yeah, he right. did. He hit her hard. Whew. <laughs> Man, what a good spot this is. <laughs> 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 
I tell you what, they've eliminated half the good cars yeah, already. Yeah. Yep. Dale and Bobby are looking real good now. I'm telling you. <laughs> no, not right now. Yeah. They're creating the excitement themselves. They've only got five or six good cars left. Mm -hmm. Let's see. One, two. Neighbor to Bill. Uh, is there somebody coming down to help us out, like Steve or somebody? Well, I think it's a matter that I have to modulate so loud when the cars are on the track, and apparently this mic can't take it. Do you want to come to us and... Uh, Six? Yeah. How, uh, who lost laps on that deal, do you know? I can't. Forty out of 500 laps completed here at Bristol, and Bobby Allison is the leader with Dale Earnhardt running second, Sterling Marlin is third, Ken Schrader fourth, and Rusty Wallace running in fifth position. In sixth spot, we have Dave Marcus. Seventh is Buddy Baker. Eighth, Ricky Rudd. Ninth is Richard Petty, and in tenth position is Kyle Petty unofficially. Richard Petty, by the way, car number 43, the familiar STP Pontiac, is making his 400th Grand National start today. There is Harry Gant's car in the pit area. The crew on the right side of it trying to straighten out the sheet metal and get the metal away from the tires. But Harry uh, suffered some rather extensive side damage to that race car in uh, turn number three. I think he not only has sheet metal damage, I think he's got some pretty serious chassis damage because he has hit something awfully hard. Well, let's go down to Jack Arrote, who's with Neil Bonnet, and it isn't looking real good for Neil at this point, is it, Jack? Indeed, indeed it's not right now, Bob, but Neil, we understand, first of all, what happened? Well, Tim Richmond blew a motor right directly in front of me, and oil just covered my car, and it just spun around and got in the wall. But you're also very upset about something else. Oh, I had a wreck at Richmond, Virginia, and they never sent an ambulance out there, and I about knocked the fence down right now, and they didn't send anybody out there yet. It's about time they start taking care of that. Well, you're okay, though. Well, I'm fixing to go find out. I rung my bell pretty good. Well, that's the word on Neil Bonnet. Mighty upset after hitting the wall. Well, Joe Rutman also had a very hard encounter with the wall. That car backed in, and Joe's still out there, I believe. No, he's pulled behind the okay, wall. He has indeed, and they're working on the rear end of that car, but uh, he sure took a shot. He really did, and that's how hard Harry Gant and Neil Bonnet hit the fence, Bob because they hit with the side of the car, so therefore it, it didn't cave it in. But Joe Rutman backed that Folgers machine in the fence and it just folded right up. All right, we have 13 cars that are on the lead lap. And let's go down now to Larry Nuber, who's with Ron Bouchard. Well, this is Ron Bouchard who came into this race with a lot of high hopes. Ron, practice was very good to you this week, wasn't it? Well, we really look forward to this race. You know, the car was really running well and uh, we just was really a victim of circumstance down here. I don't know what, what Terry did or what he was thinking of, but he ran into the back of the 75 and turned him sideways, and we were all stuck with no place to go. And, and somebody hit me in the back and drove me into it, and it just tore my car all up. Did it appear as though that Lake simply lost control first? This is the first yellow flag, of course, that we're talking about. Well, they look like uh, Terry went down here and just kind of run him in the back end and turned him sideways. And, you know, it just it was a whole bunch of us right there with no place to go. Well, one of the principals involved in this second yellow flag was Joe Rutman, and Jack Arute is with him now. Joe Rutman is starting to look like apocalypse now out there. What happened to you? Well, uh, Jackie, it appeared that the, uh, the 27 car lost an engine. And uh, when these cars get into any type of water or oil, it, uh, you just totally lose control. And it occurred to me that uh, Neil and, and uh, you know, there was three of us there got involved. And I was hoped, uh, hopefully that we didn't, uh, you know, get connected uh, solidly enough to anyone to put us out. But Tony Glover, the crew chief, just told me a moment ago that it appeared there's way too much damage to try to fix on the car. So we'll just have to wait till Darlington to give our Folgers car another run. But we was having a lot of fun and just sitting there racing just to see what we could do later on in the race. And uh, it's a shame that so much action had to start so early. When you see that much action so early, should we expect a rash of yellow cautions and a lot of crashes in this race today, or is this just a fluke? I would say this, uh, Jackie, would be a fluke. I would think that the race will settle down. You might see the race go 150, 200 laps with no cautions, and I surmise that's what's going to take place. It's odd that an engine would go that quick. You know, sometimes it's cold weather, and 
these fellows fire these motors up and you turn them 8,000, and maybe that's what happened to the engine. It appeared to me that, that he, and he lost something out of the bottom of the motor, and it was pretty pretty dramatic. The amount of oil and trash was coming out on the track, so I knew there was going to be a good ride for the old Folgers car, but we just hung on, and they're built pretty good, so we come through her safe. Well, there'll be another day for the Folgers team and Joe Rutman, but not today at Bristol. Tough luck for Joe, who was doing well. There is Harry Gant's car. They have pulled it behind the wall as they continue to try to straighten it out and get it back in the race. We have completed 45 laps. Back with more after these messages. enough cars left to wreck. The green flag is about to come out once again as we go back to racing, but it has been a very interesting first 46 laps of this race. Green back out. Bobby Allison is in front. Dale Earnhardt running in second spot as the field goes back to racing. Jackie Root asked a moment ago if there's going to be a lot of caution flags today. There aren't going to be enough ca cars out left out to cause caution flags if we keep going like this. What is all this mean? We have uh, Neil Bonnet out of the race. We have uh, Joe Rutman out of the race. We have Harry Gant out of the race. We have Bouchard, and we also have Tim Richmond. Uh, what does it mean? Anything? Well, it means that some of the competition has gone away, and not only have we lost those cars completely, we've got Bill Elliott, Darrell Waltrip, Terry Labonte, who are laps down. And you know, theoretically do not have a chance to win it. Trouble on the front straightaway. J.D. McDuffie spins and hits the wall in the front stretch. That car making contact with the inside wall, and we have another yellow flag. That's the third of the afternoon. McDuffie didn't hit the wall very hard, but he did hit it a couple of times, and there is body damage to that car also. So we're going to have our third yellow of the afternoon. Well, I guess it, that was a one-car accident, so we'd only have to have one car to have a caution flag. 19 laps so far have been run under uh, the yellow. Harry Gant work continues. Larry Newber with an update on that situation. Well, Bob, Harry has some earplugs in. He has a very difficult time hearing us down here. A lot of noise here at Bristol, but Harry, we've got yet another yellow flag. What's wrong with your car, however? Well, I got in the oil when uh, the 27 car blowed, and I hit Neil in the wall in 27 too, and so. It broke the A-frame up here so bad that you, you wouldn't be able to drive it, even though we kept working and got the tires off without losing a lap, but it wouldn't be safe to drive it, so he's going to have to change it. Harry, what about all these yellow flags? Is this a phenomenon of something wrong with the racetrack? Is everybody trying too hard, or is this simply just luck of the draw? Well, there's a lot of cars, uh, you know, smoking out there early, and uh, the motor blows on this sailor, it's real slick, and, you know, nothing you could really do. And when you're going for points, you got to fix it, don't you? No matter how hard the work is. Yeah, we got to fix it, you know, and try to hope that we can get back out without losing too many laps, and hopefully can still finish pretty good. Well, tough luck today for one of Benny Parsons' teammates, Bob. All right, Larry. And uh, while we have the time here, while the cars are still under reduced speed, we bring back by popular demand a closer look at the 35-degree banking here at Bristol. In our years of covering auto races for ESPN, we have visited many high bank paved racetracks. It all began back in 1979 at the Winchester Speedway in Winchester, Indiana. Bank, depending upon who you ask, 33, 34, 35 degrees. Used to be a high banked racetrack in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And in the beginning, believe it or not, the Nashville Speedway had banks just about that high. Now, in support of our broadcast, we've had many dramatic demonstrations as to the drama associated with just standing on a high bank paved racetrack. There was the time in Talladega, Alabama, when I was suspended in a bucket about three or maybe four stories above the first and second corners. And another time in Winchester, I was tethered on the end of the rope and tried laboriously to walk up the banking. 
But here today, we have perhaps the most dramatic of those demonstrations as to what it's like being on a high bank paved racetrack. This is the Bristol Raceway, and the banks here are 35 degrees. The drivers will tell you that the G-forces are just tremendous. And even staying on the banks, just staying on the banks is difficult unless you're at speed. Now, to, to prove this, I have a couple of my able body assistants here, Bob Jenkins and Jack Arut. And uh, watch how easy this thing takes off down the banking. Well, we never get tired of seeing this, Benny. This worked out just perfect for us. We thought maybe the car would scoot on its side down the banking, but it did just what we wanted it to. That's beautiful. And you know, that's from a dead stop. Just imagine what he would do at 100 miles an hour if it started rolling. Exactly right. <laughs> So the cars are being lined up in their two abreast formation for a restart next time around. But before we get the green, let's go down to the pit area. Here's Jack Arute again. It, it could be that Junior Johnson was a prophet because as you see in his pits, he has literally emptied his truck and put all of the parts and pieces right down here. Now you know that both cars have already had a problem on his team, but just several seconds ago, the number 47 car of Ron Bouchard came to this pile of parts and cannibalized the rear end in order to get some pieces that they need to get Ron Bouchard back. This could be very important right here in Junior Johnson's pit. If we continue to have yellow fever, it could become the auto parts house for Winston Cup Grand Nationals. Well, let's hope this yellow fever is uh, eradicated here in the uh, next few laps. Uh, we've had enough crashes and bashes for the first uh, 40, 54 laps of this race. Field comes off of turn number four, and the green flag comes out once again. Bobby Allison continues to set the pace as they move down the backstretch. Dale Earnhardt running in second spot. The third car in line is Terry Labonte, but he is down a few laps, as is Daryl Waltrip, the fourth car in the procession as they come down the street. Daryl Waltrip has some heavy damage to the automobile, Bob, and it doesn't look like it's affected how the car is running. It looks like he's running very well. Wouldn't it be odd if he were to win this race today? Well, it really would, and I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility at all. We do have 12 cars on the lead lap, and we haven't uh, finished even a fifth of this race yet, and a lot of things can happen. So Waltrip and several other of those drivers who were involved in the initial accident with Lake Speed and Ron Bouchard are certainly not out of the race. Larry Newber once again in the pit area. Is this going to be a day of surprises? Because of all the yellow flags, there is third are not even pitted on the front stretch. Right running right now in third place is Sterling Marlin. They just changed the, the scoreboard. Rusty Wallace is up there, as is Ken Schrader. They weren't even expected to run in the top ten, as I mentioned. They've been pitted on the back stretch, but right now they're in the top five positions. Well, that's uh, definitely a good point. It could be a surprise winner here at Bristol this afternoon in the Valley Dale 500, but for right now, Bobby Allison and Dale Earnhardt are running up front. Bobby Allison, 47 years old from Hueytown, Alabama, finished 19th in this race last year and finished second in the second race of 1984 here in Bristol. So it's a race track that he likes, and he has certainly been the uh, dominant force in the race to this point. Last spring for this very race, the Valleydale 500, Bobby Allison was the dominant force in that race. After the race was over, they, he had a trick gear or a trick rear end of the car, and everyone felt like that's why he was such a dominant force. He doesn't have it now, but yet he's still a dominant force, so maybe there was something there other than the rear end last spring. Race for third and fourth position involves number 95 Sterling Marlin from Columbia, Tennessee. Right behind him is Rusty Wallace, last year's Rookie of the Year on the Grand National Circuit. And right behind Rusty Wallace is the number five Chevrolet of Jeff Bodine from Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, originally from upstate New York. Well, Jeff Bodine is going to have to show a lot of patience right now. And Jeff is on the board. He's third place. He wants to impress these people. He's going to try to keep Rusty Wallace and Jeff Bodine back as long as he can. They're a little faster than he is right now, but yet they can't try to muscle their way by. We're going to have accidents just like we had a moment ago. 
And most of the cars here running together have not made a pit stop. Now, Jeff Bodine has stopped, but Rusty Wallace has not, and Sterling Marlin has not. Bodine, as you can see, was able to pass Rusty Wallace there on the back stretch. So he moves up now into fourth position as Marlin continues to hold third spot in that red number 95 McGregg Racing Chevrolet. A little bit of smoke from the right rear tire of Rusty Wallace in that Alugard Spectrum Furniture Pontiac. Rusty, of course, from St. Louis, Missouri. Sixty-seven laps completed. Jeff Bodine looks to the inside of Sterling Marlin down the back stretch. Can't move into third position, however, as Marlin continues to hold that spot. Marlin, of course, is second generation driver. And now Bodine moves to the inside, coming off the banking in turn number two, but still Jeff cannot make the pass. But some good racing going out there on the racetrack. Well, the most uh, one of the uh, three yellow flags that we have had over the speedway involved an accident which was caused when Tim Richmond's car blew a motor and dumped some oil. And Jack Aroot is with Tim. Well, well, you know, we had an in-car radio with Tim Richmond, and we never got a chance to use it, Tim. First of all, the blown engine. You had your hands full out there for a minute, didn't you? Well, we did, but we didn't know why we had our hands full. Just going into three, the car, like, locked the rear end up and turned it around backwards before we ever got into the corner. So, you know, finally when we got it back here in the pits, we was able to see it, it kicked the rod out of the side of the block, and that's what put all the oil onto the tires and turned the car around. But at the, before that, we didn't know why it happened. We thought maybe the rear end locked up or whatever. But it did blow up the engine and uh, kick the rod out. Now, this place is a little different than a super speedway. We're mired in here till the end of the race. Normally, you could get in your van and go back up to Lake Norman. What does a race driver do for about 450 laps? Watch the competition? Well, for one thing, you don't sleep in this stuff unless noise puts you to sleep. Uh, We've got a problem. We've got a problem. We've got to spin. We're going back up to the tower. Okay, it's in ahead, turn please. number two, Jackie, and it involves rookie Eddie Birschwale from San Antonio, Texas. The car spun in turn number two and uh, kicked up a lot of smoke, but he continued on the racetrack, so we have no yellow flag over the track right now. Birschwale will undoubtedly be coming in for a pit stop. In fact, I think uh, the tire on the right front of the car may be rubbing against the uh, fender work. It was, Bob. He went by, it was rubbing. Evidently, there was some contact up in the corner with another car. He's knocked the fender in on the tire. He went, there is caution on the racetrack, caution on the speedway. Now we do bring out the caution. Beerschwale had moved into his pit area, which is on the back stretch. There are pits both on the front straightaway and on the back stretch. He had moved into the pit area, but the yellow now comes out and the race back to the yellow flags finish line. And 75 laps now are completed with our fourth yellow of the afternoon. There may be some oil over there in turn number two. So pit stops being made, and while we're under yellow, we will have more and return after these messages. Kyle Petty, I guess. Kyle. And Papa behind him. Mm-hmm. Okay. Where did 
Phil Parsons, will he fall out of this race? I guess so. I think he must be out, yeah. He was smoking rather badly mm -hmm. on that caution, yeah. yeah. Don Hume's being pushed on the back straightaway. Might as well get a shot of that for Bill. Oh, he got it going. <laughs> Bob Jenkins, Benny Parsons, Larry Newber, and Jack Aroot back at the Valleydale 500 at Bristol International Raceway in Tennessee. We are under caution once again with 79 laps completed. Let's go down to the pit area. Here's Larry. Well, Bob, with all the caution flags, Dale Earnhardt's strategy, who's running second right now, has changed a little bit. Whereas he may have had to race as flat out as fast as he could all day long. Now maybe he can wait just a little bit. This tire here just came off of the outside or the right side of Dale Earnhardt's car. And the tire wear is excellent. Now they think they can only go at speed, maybe one set on the outside per stop. But they're very pleased with the tire wear. Earnhardt and Allison, they may be home free, but then again, maybe not. That number 11 is really moving up. Now one of the guys at number 11, Darrell Waltrip, passed recently is with, well, he's, his crew chief is with Jack Aroot over on the backstretch right now, Jack. Normally, the backstretch is kind of like the Maytag repairman shop. It's the loneliest place in town, but not today. The attrition has brought some of the back markers to a fine afternoon. Ronnie Grayson is the crew chief on Sterling Marlin's car. First of all, Ronnie, are you surprised at how well you're running? Well, we wanted to run good here. This is our home track. Of course, our shop's right across the street, and we really worked hard, and we come over here to practice the test, didn't get a chance to move, so we just had to make do it the best we could. The car's running real good, and we're all happy about it. Running this strong up front so early, does that put added pressure on you, the crew, to try and get him in and out of the pit so he can stay up front? No, I just want to leave him there all day if the car will stay there. I just want him to run like that all day. Well, it's not lonely here anymore, and if you put your arm around Ronnie Grayson, you can feel him shaking a little bit because he may be feeling the pressure just a tad. All right, Jackie, and he did make a pit stop during this caution period that has dropped Sterling to eighth position, but he's still on the lead lap. Ron Bouchard has come back out, although he doesn't have a front end on that race car. Bouchard is back out there in competition. He is 53 laps down. Now, Daryl Waltrip is three laps down to the field. Terry Labonte is two laps down, and Lake Speed also two laps down. Uh, out front at this point, the car behind the pace car is Kyle Petty. And right behind Kyle is Father Richard Petty, who, as we mentioned earlier, is in his 400th Grand National race here this afternoon. Dale Earnhardt shown in third spot, followed by Jeff Bodine and then Bobby Allison. Darrell Walters crew got an awfully good pit stop on the, on the caution flag. He moved up. He was able to pull alongside Kyle Petty because he is lapped down. And I would think Darrell Walter right now has an excellent chance of getting one of those lap backs, particularly if we can get another caution play. Well, we'll try to uh, establish radio contact here with uh, Jeff Bodine. Jeff, this is Bob Jenkins up in the booth. Uh, do you copy me? We've got you, Bob. Jeff, let's go back a few laps to that incident up there in the third turn when Lake Speed uh, spun. Uh, where were you and was your car damaged because of the incident? We, we got through that wreck fine, but uh, the next one where Tia Richard blew is when we spun around and somebody slid down into us, but it did hurt the car. We were pretty lucky in both of those accidents. And the fortunate thing for you, Jeff, is that you didn't lead a lap and you're still in fourth place, so you're looking pretty good. Well, we think so. The car's running good. Uh, we just hope we keep the Levi Gear car up front. All right, we'll be watching you. We are about to go back to green here. The pace car is pulling into the pit area. There is Jeff Bodine in fourth spot. The car below him is the number 64 of Clark Dwyer. And with 83 laps about to be completed, we are back to green. Kyle Petty is the leader. The 24-year-old son of Richard from Randall, North Carolina, in that 711 Ford that is prepared by the Wood Brothers out in front. 
great start for Kyle Petty because he had Darrell Waltrip on the inside. He wants to keep Darrell a lap around. Darrell on the inside have an advantage because Kyle Petty was the leader of the race. He's the fellow who starts it. Now, Darrell is trying him on the back straightaway, but Kyle cuts him off. Well, they almost uh, got nose to tail there on the back stretch, and Darrell came very close to bumping him. But Kyle is keeping Darrell Waltrip a lap down at least this point. Now Darrell is trying to high side him in turn number two, but still not able to pass. Back down to Jackaroo. Two points to consider, Bob. One, this brilliant race to the front with Darrell Waltrip and Kyle Petty. That 7-11 team came together this year, and it was somewhat suspect. A lot of people felt that probably it was a poor choice on the Wood Brothers' part. They have been very positive about it from the beginning, and this seems to show it right now. The other point to consider is that Kyle Petty today is suffering very badly from the flu. He reported to the hospital emergency room this morning with a temperature of 103 degrees. Seems to me that he ought to get the flu all the time if that's the way he's going to race with it. Well, you're absolutely right. He's doing a great job, but Darrell Walter has passed him, and now Darrell gets one of the laps back, and he's now only down two laps. And Terry Labonte is also moving up quickly and trying to get a lap back here. To Labonte on the high side of the racetrack in car number 44. Nose to tail and door handle to door handle racing up there in turn number two. It is Dale Earnhardt right behind Terry Labonte, and Richard Petty is right beside of Dale Earnhardt. <laughs> I tell you what, it gets awfully tight getting off these corners for those cars side by side. Well, we've seen evidence of that <laughs> All greatly day. already. Kyle Petty, the leader, Kyle's best finish this year in a Grand National race fifth at the uh, Rockingham 500. He also had a seventh place finish at Richmond on the half mile. He was 11th at Atlanta and 37th in the Daytona 500. But now he's beginning to slow down just a little bit as Terry Labonte and Dale Earnhardt and Bobby Allison all pass Kyle Petty to the inside of the racetrack and even Father Richard goes around. Well, he's, got on the, he's got himself on the outside and he really doesn't have much choice but stay out there and fall back in line whenever he can. And it, well, the way the line is, it's going to be quite a while before he can get back on the inside. Dale Earnhardt is the leader. He has Terry Labonte in front of him, but Labonte a couple of laps down now. Bobby Allison running in second spot. Richard Petty is third. And Jeff Bodine is in fourth spot. Bodine to the inside of Richard Petty in the backstretch. Still some great racing despite the fact that we have had numerous incidents of cars coming together out there. They're still not letting that bother them. And they're running right beside each other. is Bobby Allison running in second spot. Bobby qualified in second position for this race and led the early laps, but now he has fallen to second place behind Dale Earnhardt. We'll see if Allison can pass Earnhardt. Allison going to the high side of the racetrack. Earnhardt's patience is wearing a little thin. He's kind of pushing Terry Labonte through the corners. He's trying to say, Labonte, get out of the way and let us go on, but Terry is trying his best to get one of those laps back. Continue to watch Dale Earnhardt, Bobby Allison with Terry Labonte leading those two down the back stretch. Bobby Allison to the high side of Earnhardt, still looking for an opportunity to pass. Gary Nelson, of course, the manager of the Bobby Allison team, and he is with our Larry Newman. We're standing by with Gary Nelson, team manager for Bobby Allison, and Gary, with all the yellow flags that we've had today, it's kind of scary to see Bobby running up front in heavy traffic. Well, it's really an unusual race to have this many of the top cars have problems this early. It's a long way to go, and uh, we're going to kind of sit back and take it easy and hope we survive all the problems, and maybe we'll be there at the end. Gary, Bobby has won four times here. Darrell Waltrip, seven of the last eight. Is this just a matter of keeping pace with the number 11 now that he's behind? Well, you know, Darrell definitely has won a lot of races here, but a lot of people forget he won a few in driving a Digard car, too. So uh, I think the 11 and the 22 are the two strongest cars now. Uh, the three cars also tough, too. We're, we're keeping an eye on those three. And we'll just see where we are at the end. Well, last year, the second race of last year, Bobby Allison in the Digard car apparently had him covered, so we'll see. 
we will see Allison still running right with Dale Earnhardt on the racetrack, but Allison for the moment is still in second place. And now um, Jeff Bodine has moved up in third spot, very close to the Bobby Allison rear end. Allison high once again in turn three. Dale Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt has lost the handle the last couple of laps. I don't really know what, but the car is extremely loose in the corner. It's slipping and sliding. He's having problems. And Bobby, ooh, they got together coming off too. There is the uh, Jet Bodine car sneaking into your picture on the right behind Bobby Allison. There are the first three as they go to the high side to pass Clark Plyer in car number 64. Bobby Allison's best finish of fifth this year at the Atlanta 500. And now Allison moves to the inside of the ill handling Dale Earnhardt car. But Earnhardt still able to hold off the challenge as smoke comes from the right side. Rubber, great racing. Allison may be able to get him here in turn number one, maybe turn number two, or maybe down the back stretch. They're side by side as they go down the back stretch. Earnhardt with just a slight advantage. And now Allison pulls alongside and evens it up. And off of turn number four, Allison with a slight advantage momentarily, but Earnhardt still is in the lead. <laughs> Earnhardt's not let him take anything. Earnhardt might have found him improved. He seems to run a little better higher than he has been on the low side of the racetrack. And Three. there certainly isn't any traffic up there where he is. They are approaching slower now. Allison looks like it's a little sideways coming off of turn four, but uh, manages to hang on to it. And now they're approaching Don Hewitt going high to pass in in turn number two. That looks like Bobby's chest is going away as well. Let's go down to Jack Aroot, who's with Richard Childress. And, and, Richard Child and Richard Childress is the crew chief on Dale Earnhardt's car. Richard, it looks like maybe the handle went away on the car a little bit. We lost the power steering. He's driving it now with just a straight steering box. And it's pretty hard on him right now. He's running without any power steering. But he's still awfully one tough customer. He's battling back and forth with Bobby Allison. What do you do now? Do you make some chassis adjustments when the power steering goes out? Ain't much we can do. We'll take a look at it if we get a long caution. Other than that, it's going to be up to Dale from here on. Well, power steering, it could be a problem later in the race. When you lose it, you know, Benny Parsons, that is a handful. I do not envy that boy at <laughs> all. <laughs> that is cruel and unusual punishment. Having to drive around the racetrack without power steering is cruel and unusual punishment. Neil Bonnet has repaired his car. And he's going back on the racetrack trying to get some Winston Cup points. And, you know, he, he mentioned a moment ago that his bell was rung pretty badly in that accident. I wonder if that's Neil in the car or if that might be a relief driver since he was involved in the accident. He was involved in the incident with Tim Richmond up there in turn number three that put a couple of cars behind the wall. Harry Gant is still behind the wall as they do work on that car. But Neil Bonnet and his crew have managed to get that car back out onto the racetrack. Dale Earnhardt continues to lead and now has opened up a little bit of daylight between himself and Bobby Allison. Running third is Jeff Bodine. Richard Petty is fourth and Ricky Rudd is in fifth spot. Sixth place belongs to Rusty Wallace. Seventh is Dave Marcus. Eighth position Sterling Marlin. Ninth is Buddy Baker. Tenth is Bobby Hillen Jr. And eleventh position is Kyle Petty. Twelfth is Jimmy Beans. And thirteenth is Ken Schrader. Those 13 cars are on the lead lap as we completed just a little over a fifth of this race. 500 laps, 266 and a half miles make up the Valleydale 500 here at Bristol International Raceway. And this is one of two races that we will have for you from this racetrack this year. We'll be back in the fall for the traditional night race here, and it'll be the first time that we will have presented a grand national race in prime time under the lights at Bristol later on this year. Benny, I'm a little surprised at the crowd here this afternoon. Of course, it's Easter weekend, and perhaps a lot of people are uh, either involved in family activities or perhaps working on this Saturday afternoon. And besides that, it is very uncomfortable out there. As we told you, 52 degrees, but the uh, wind is uh, blowing at about 30 miles an hour and making the wind chill, I know, in the 30s. It's not very comfortable, but a good crowd on hand here this afternoon. You know, I really felt like that a lot of people was not like us would have to work today, but it looks like everyone that was here last Sunday is back. Great crowd today, and they're seeing a great race. 
There's Richard Petty and Rusty Wallace still going after it. Richard is having some problems. He's having to go high around each corner of the racetrack. Rusty's able to stay on the bottom of the racetrack, which is clearly the fastest way around the racetrack. Richard is running in fifth spot, and Rusty Wallace is running in sixth position right now. And that other car in the picture is Ronnie Thomas in car 41. Well, we mentioned power steering problems with Dale Earnhardt. Here's more on power steering. One item has done more to increase a driver's career span on the Richmond Cup Grand National Tour than anything else is power steering. What we have here is a power steering unit that goes on a Grand National car. But just as in every case where there's a good side, there's a bad side, and the Neil Bonnet team discovered it at Richmond, Virginia. When you roll the tire away from their automobile, we'll show you exactly what happened. When he crashed badly in turn number two as he was leading the race, the tire rubbed up against the upper ball joint here. The reason for that, he couldn't feel the tire going down because of the fact that power steering was masking the handling effects of the car. The solution here at Bristol, Tennessee, take a whole new set of inputs when they work the turns. Make sure that if a tire is going down, he feels it somewhere else than in the steering wheel. And Betty, you might elaborate on uh, just exactly what it feels like when something is going wrong with a tire and how that affects the power steering. Well, the power steering, you certainly would not be able to feel a, a flat tire like you would without power steering. But power steering is such a tremendous advantage to these race cars getting through the turns. We see it in Bristol. You can imagine what these fellows are going through, watching them go through these turns, just how difficult that it really is. Power steering makes that job a great deal easier. Uh, sure there is some disadvantages and that like Dale Earnhardt now is without power steering so the car is awfully hard to drive but that's only going to happen one out of every 50 or 60 races and for the uncomfort that they have that one race he will have comfort in the other 49 or 59. The lack of power steering is certainly not slowing him down he maintains the lead and has now about a six car length advantage on Bobby Allison and in third spot is Jeff Bodine. Back with more from Bristol, Tennessee in the Valleydale 500. Establish that firmly. Uh, either one of you pit guys down there that can confirm that Neil is in the car. Jackie, okay, I see Jack. Okay, thank you, Jack. Okay. is the leader of the Valleydale 500 with 126 laps completed. Bobby Allison spins in turn number two. He was running in second spot, and he has made contact with the wall. So another of the top contenders has a problem here at Bristol. Allison's car has stalled in the infield. Down in the turn two area, there is Bobby. The yellow comes out, and another interesting development. The car is moving again now. I don't. I thought maybe the, he had had an engine problem, but the car is moving again. He's got it restarted, and here he comes. 
Bobby Allison had led 56 laps of this race, laps 21 through 77. That's when Dale Earnhardt took the lead. And here's a replay, Betty. He lost something in the right front. I would think that the right front tire went flat or something. He just. Oh, Jeff, Ooh. again, Jeff Bodine just gets by. Again, he just. He, but the tire is up. Is the, yes, the right front tire is still up. Well, just one of those things. The car took off toward the wall, and Bobby couldn't save it. Made there. contact with the wall and uh, spun to the infield. Possibly there's some oil or something. I, I don't. I think there's got to be something broke in the right front of, the, of that car because. Uh, well, we'll find out in a moment. Let's be speculating. Bobby Allison has stopped over in the backstretch pits. And his normal pit is That's Phil Parsons right there. That is Phil Parsons who dropped out of this race very early, and he's uh, looks a steering like steering wheel. He's going to get a steering wheel. Unbelievable. <laughs> Phil Parsons goes to his car that dropped out of the race early on and is removing the steering wheel and apparently will take it to Bobby yep. Allison. <laughs> he's Whoops. Got, oh, <laughs> it's still attached. Oh, he's got the radios in there. <laughs> Bobby Allison doesn't have a steering wheel. Well, that certainly explains why he couldn't save the car and keep it from hitting the wall. There is Phil handing the steering wheel through the window to Bobby Allison, and Allison pulls away immediately. This is amazing. <laughs> well, here comes Allison now. Out of the backstretch pits, he's being held up there while the field comes around, but he will be, I assume. <laughs> That's cruel. They holding him up while the field goes by, right? He's only two laps down. He doesn't knock the fence down. Field under yellow here on the main straightaway, and now Bobby Allison gets back out there on the racetrack, but is heading for his own pit area. 134 laps completed. A lot of interesting developments in this race already, and we've got a lot more to go. We'll be right back. Jeff Bodine on his superstition or his good luck charm. Whatever it is, I want <laughs> Boy, some of no it. Kidding. Uh, and try to get out there to fill too if you can, guys, and <laughs> see what Bobby exactly trailer. said. Jackie Jackie's in the pit down there. Did the steering wheel break or what? It also has a broken windshield. the other problems Bobby Allison something has something has broken his windshield we see a on the windshield chrome there we see where something is in it and cracked the windshield uh, I don't know if it got inside the car maybe that's one of the reasons that it did get inside and break the steering wheel but Bobby is they have the hood up now looking under under the hood of the automobile trying to figure out what's wrong I guess five caution periods for a total of 34 laps so far 135 laps completed now as we go back to a green and a problem just as the green comes out. Neil Bonnet in trouble for the second time this afternoon, hitting the wall on the inside of the racetrack. Well, I think some more factor in determining what happens out there on the racetrack. There is Daryl Waltrip in car number 11, just made a pit stop. He's back out there, though. Let's go down now to Jack Aroot. And I'm with Junior Johnson, the owner of the Johnson Racing Team. And Junior, these cautions seem to be working to Daryl's advantage. You all seem to think you can get your laps back and be in the hunt for the win. Well, if, if uh, Earnhardt has any trouble, I think we can outrun the rest of them. So that'd give us an opportunity to be able to get, you know, get back our laps. Because if we can get to lead and hold it, when they have a caution, we'll automatically make up a lap. Uh, if he has any trouble at all, I think we'll be right in it. Well, Dale Earnhardt already has trouble. We've had a report that he's lost the power steering unit in the car. Will that give you an added advantage? Well, it's just determined on how strong Dale is. If he can uh, stand up there and drive that thing without power steering all day, he'll still be tough because Neil drove about 200 miles down in Atlanta without power steering. So I wouldn't say that it'd be an advantage. Uh, if anything, it, you know, it'll hurt him a little bit, but we, he's got to have trouble for us to beat him. 
Well, it sounds as if maybe Junior Johnson still wants to sit on the fence for a moment, but the clocking's Benny Parsons. Cost, according to you, it looks like Waltrip is one of the faster cars. He certainly is. He and Dale Earnhardt both are, are equally as fast. It's hard to sell, who, tell who is the quickest. Darrell Waltrip has more to gain right now in trying to get his laps back. He will probably be trying a little bit harder than that. Dale Earnhardt in the next couple hundred laps anyway. But I don't think we really have to worry about Dale Earnhardt uh, getting fatigued or tired because of lack of power steering out there. Do you? Oh, I do because the thing is very hard to turn. I was thinking I was while we waited a break a moment ago. I was thinking he's going to be like Popeye. He's going to have arms like Popeye <laughs> when this thing's over today because it really wears on you. Well, you can imagine your own car with power steering. Take when you cut the ignition switch off and the engine stops turning. Just how hard it is to turn. These cars are a great deal similar to that, Bob. Neil Bonnet's car is being taken off of the racetrack. It's on the back of a wrecker there on the uh, right side of your screen. It's being uh, pushed back into the pit area. Bonnet uh, out of the car and OK. Bobby Allison has been in numerous times in the last few laps. And now Bobby Allison is pulling the car behind the wall. It's the guy who led several laps of this race and was running in second spot to Dale Earnhardt before encountering the wall in turn number two. Bobby Allison is behind the wall. And look who's pulling out onto the racetrack, Harry Gant. I was just thinking, while well, one goes behind, one pulls out. So at least we've got the same amount of cars on the racetrack. So Harry Gant rejoins this race. On the wall uh, down toward the first turn and as a matter of fact the third turn area is a yellow stripe and that is for the rookies Benny. You know when someone told me that Bob that that was for the rookies to tell them we're at Bristol to back off the throttle to go in the turn and I thought they were joking <laughs> but you you tell me that seriously that's for the rookies and I don't see what has going to really help many because I don't know how they're going to look outside to see the stripe. It needs to be across the racetrack. It's going to do them any good. You would think it would be very hard to uh, see as they come down the straightaway at. Uh, I don't see how. Yeah I don't see how they could possibly use that. I thought somebody put it there as a joke. <laughs> there is one though at the uh, entrance to turn one and the entrance to turn number three to a breast formation uh, once again as we are about to go back to green. The leader of the race is Rusty Wallace in car number two with Earnhardt running second and Bodine third. And the speed picks up. The green comes out once again. And I don't think that probably Rusty Wallace will be in the lead very long. He now has Bill Elliott between himself and Dale Earnhardt. But as they go down the back stretch, I think we might see Dale Earnhardt and do some passing here and establish himself as the leader of this race once again. If he doesn't pass, he won't, it won't be from lack of trying, I'll tell you that. <laughs> now he's moving to the outside of Bill Elliott, getting the car a little bit wide, a little bit too wide, as a matter of fact, the second turn, and not being able to pass Bill Elliott. Now he takes a better line into turns number three and four, pulls alongside Bill Elliott, comes down the straightaway and passes Elliott, and now... Will is trying to put himself back in the lead. Rusty Wallace right now is the leader of this race in the number two Pontiac Alvigard Spectrum Furniture car. Earnhardt moving to the inside of Rusty Wallace. Staying behind him though for the time being. Jeff Bodine now running in third spot. Now Earnhardt again to the inside down the back stretch. And this time he will go back into the lead. He probably isn't as concerned with Rusty Wallace right now as he is Darrell Walter. He wants to get in front. Of, oh, that's oh a another spin. spin. Dave Marcus loses it and loops in turn number four. Slows everybody down behind him, and I don't think anybody touched him, but it was a miraculous job of driving by a few of them. Marcus was running in fifth place when Darryl that Walter, occurred. Darrell Walter's trying to get another lap back. And here he comes, and by golly, he's going to do it. Or is he? I don't know if the question is, is whether or not that was the yellow or whether they they, that they had already had the yeah. caution play but he plainly beat Earnhardt back to the line if they were not already under the caution play. Well that's a question we'll have to have answered from NASCAR scoring. Now we'll take another look at that uh, spin up in turn number four involving Dave Marcus. Well it just gets touched by Ricky Rudd just touched by Ricky Rudd. Ricky goes on the inside that's. Kenny Schrader on the outside. Lake, Lake Speed, speed the on the inside. inside. Everybody well, manages to avoid it. Everyone though. managed. I thought that Lake Speed, the early accident, the first accident we saw, I thought Lake Speed was going to do the same thing and come back down. But 
He didn't. He went back up the racetrack, got Darrell Walter, and Ron Bouchard. I wonder what the world's record is for caution flags. <laughs> well, I tell you, this is uh, possibly a world record performance here this afternoon as we have had six caution flags so far in the first 150 laps of this race. Well, we showed you a stripe on the wall that indicates rookies, and there is also one on the race car. Some organizations use streamers on roll cages and others just, well, point and chuckle, but Grand National Racing is a little more sophisticated. This yellow stripe visible to only the drivers means something. A lot of these drivers come with years and years of experience in the short tracks, but in Grand National Racing, a yellow stripe means a rookie. Track facts are being brought to you by the Levi Garrett Chewing Tobacco Company. Time after time, the quality comes through. We are yellow once again at Bristol International Raceway in the Valleydale 500. With the leader being shown right now as Dale Earnhardt, there are the top five. We'll be right back. Did he? He did get the lap back, so he's now one lap down. Bo Dine's behind the wall. I guess you know that. What? Oh. Oh, Neil, this. Oh, boy, I can hear myself. What's going on? Can you hear me now? Hello, Larry. We got you. Okay, what's the story? You mean you can't hear me in queue? That it has to be turned on for you to hear me. Yeah, we might want to I, talk to. Him. I have done nothing. Jeff on the radio. Does that mean we're back to normal? Does that mean we're... Back at Bristol International Raceway, and Jeff Bodine, who is running third in the field, has pulled his car behind the wall. And Benny, it looks like they're looking at the underneath side of the car toward the rear. It looks like they're working in the in the rear end section of the car, the back section of the car. Well, we'll try to uh, find out exactly what is a problem from Jeff, if he can hear us on the radio. Jeff, uh, if you can hear me, what's the problem? Do you know? Five, we just uh, broke the rear end gears. Uh... They've been seeing a little smoke come out of the back of the car. Apparently, we lost the grease and the gears overheated and tore up. They're going to change the rear end right now and try to get back out and salvage what we can. Well, you were running very well, Jeff. You were in third spot. Uh, we hope you can get back out there and at least get some uh, valuable points to keep you in the point lead. Well, that's what we're going to try to do. Yeah, we thought we were running good enough to win this race. Uh, the Levi Garrett Exide Motor Oil Beneficial Insurance Car was running real good. We're going to get it back out there. One thing you don't do in Grand National Racing is that that's quick. So we're going to fix it and get back out. And we'll talk to you when you get back out there. Jeff Bodine in the pits. Dale Earnhardt, the leader. Now leading in second spot is Richard Petty. Round number 43 in his 400th Grand National start here this afternoon. Third place is Ricky Rudd. Fourth is Sterling Marlin, who continues to run on the lead lap and is looking very good, as a matter of fact. And in fifth position is Buddy Baker in car number 88. And Bobby Hillen Jr. and running in sixth position there in the car number car. Bobby, of course, from Midland, Texas. Right ahead of him is Buddy Baker in car number 88. There's a good look at Bobby Hillen Jr. That kid's going to learn a lot today. He's only about 20 years old. He's going to learn a lot today running in between Buddy Baker and Richard Petty and some of those other fellas. He has been in all four Grand National races so far this year. Bobby Hillen Jr. has his best finish, an impressive ninth during the Daytona 500. And he finished just outside the top 10 on two other occasions. At Richmond, he was 11th. In Atlanta, he was 12th. And finished 24 in the Rockingham 500. He is 20 years of age. Will turn 21 on June the 5th. It's a shame that you that the age of wisdom you. Well, there's a lot of damage. 
research on race cars out there. You can hardly find a car out there on the racetrack that doesn't have some kind of body damage on it. And perhaps one of those cars is Richard Petty. I think he's kept his nose pretty clean out there. But it doesn't look like that that car, as you indicated earlier, Benny, is running as well as it could because he is dropping back and losing positions. Buddy Baker challenging him now for the third spot. Yeah, he just isn't getting through the turns like he normally does. And Sterling Marlin, again, I don't think we can say too much about Sterling Marlin today because what a great run for this young man. And I read the other day that his sponsor, Auto Shack, they're trying to entice these people to go with them full time. This is only a, a part time sponsor. And today's been a great run for Sterling Marlin in that car. There is Sterling in car number 95. In Tennessee, his father, Cuckoo Marlin, a competitor for many years on the Grand National Circuit. Bobby Hill, and we talked about him a moment ago. Oh, he almost lost it coming off the second corner a moment ago. He's really having some problems right now. But back to Richard Petty and Buddy Baker. Buddy Baker now knows what it's like to be an owner. He is one of the owners of that automobile. He and Danny Shift, Danny Gastonia, formed their own team. And they're going racing. After 24, 25 years, Buddy Baker has finally gotten up to the point of being an owner. And the sponsors on that car, Liquid Wrench and Bullfrog Nits. Crew chief is Robert Harrington. Buddy currently 22nd in the Winston Cup point standings for 1985's best finish in the year so far, a fourth at the Daytona 500. He and Richard Petty are going at it out there. Two veterans on the Winston Cup Grand National Circuit battling for third position here in Bristol. Now Buddy Baker moving alongside Richard Petty in turn number three. And I would think that Richard might just say, well, you go right ahead, Buddy. If you want spot, you can have it. There's a lot but, of uh, laps to go. But he didn't. He's still he's racing him. And that, that's that's good because you would think, yeah, what the heck, what's the point? But he's racing him. He's trying to he still has that urge. Richard Petty still has that competitive urge to race those guys when they when he tries to pass more, they try to pass him. One thing that we will update you on is the situation involving Daryl Waltrip. He did get back one of his laps, so he is now only one lap down to the field after that incident in the very early stages of the race in which he lost three laps. He's gotten two of them back, and if he can get one more back, he'll be on the lead lap and certainly a contender for the win here at Bristol. Baker, as you can see, has gotten around Richard Petty, moving from 18th to third position. As there is Bill Elliott moving to the inside of Buddy Baker down the main straightaway. Bill Elliott's car is strong today. I walked to the pits early on before the race started and talked to some people, and they felt like that Elliott was one of the cars to beat today, one of the, one of the quicker cars here. He was involved in that first accident, had to replace the radiator, but we can see right now that he clearly did have a very good car today. I believe he lost about five laps during that lengthy uh, pit stop that he made to replace the radiator. Bill, of course, has won two races this year on the circuit at Daytona and the most recent Winston Cup race at Atlanta. But in the other two races, he's had uh, bad luck, finished 22nd and 23rd. Well, at Richmond and Rockingham, he almost tore the wall down at Richmond. And about the same thing at Rockingham, destroyed two cars in two races. I talked to him earlier today. He said he had sprayed his cars with two cans of anti-wall repellent. <laughs> <laughs> he should have sprayed it with anti-car repellent. <laughs> He is fifth in the Winston Cup points at this time. Bill Elliott from Dawsonville, Georgia, in the Coors Melling Four. There is the leader, meanwhile, Dale Earnhardt, without power steering, but certainly able to hold off the challenges, at least for the moment. He has about a full straightaway length lead now on Ricky Rudd, who's running in second spot. Earnhardt is really hooked up today. And I don't know that Daryl Walter right now, I, it looks like Daryl is not able to run as fast as Dale Earnhardt, although there is a long ways to go. I think that Daryl right now just, I would have guessed that he's just riding around. We've only completed 175 laps. Uh, again, 500 laps, 325 laps to go. It's a long ways before this thing's over. the leader Dale Earnhardt down the back stretch headed into turn number three there is the leader now the second place car is number 15 Ricky Rudd and he'll be moving into your frame right now he's the fourth car in the line there there he is Rudd is following Dale or rather uh, Daryl Walter 
Now in third position is Buddy Baker in car number 88. And there is Buddy right there, third spot. The interval between second and third shown very graphically for you. And in fourth position is the car right behind Buddy Baker by just a few car lengths, as a matter of fact, Richard Petty. And finally, in fifth spot is the number 95 of Sterling Marlin, and he also is right behind his the car right ahead of him. So that sets for you the cars on the lead lap. There are two other cars on the lead lap, but are almost ready to be lapped. They are Rusty Wallace and Bobby Hill. So there is the leader, Dale Earnhardt, in the Wrangler Chevrolet. And trouble up in turn number two. It's Daryl Waltrip who is into the fence again. Waltrip spinning and moving down the racetrack and narrowly missing Buddy Baker. Buddy just squeaked by as Daryl slid down the banking. Daryl can get the car going. He'll save a lap, but it doesn't. No, he's going to coast back so. in towards the pit area. He's going to do the same thing that Bobby Allison did and move uh, to this area between turns one and two in the infield. Doesn't look like it's going to be an eighth win out of nine races for Darren Waltrip as trouble has plagued him again. And look who's helping push Phil the Parsons. Phil Parsons. Everyone, everyone that spins over in the second corner <laughs> fills over there to direct traffic. He helped Bobby Allison get a new steering wheel on his car and now he's helping push Darren Waltrip back to his pit area. So the Junior Johnson crew has certainly suffered some misfortune here today as both cars have been damaged severely in accidents. There is Richard Petty in the pit area. The leaders uh, have all come in. Darrell Walter uh, brings out this caution period, and Dale Earnhardt is going to you can see the activity on pit road. Lake Speed pulls back out, so does Bill Elliott. There goes Richard Petty, Bobby Allison, Harry Gant, Bobby Hiller Jr., and Kyle Petty are still in the pit area. There's Bobby Allison, and he has been on the pit road longer than anybody else. Now, finally, he gets going. They walked around the car looking at the car like something was wrong with it. 181 laps are completed. Darrell Waltrip has spun and hit the wall up in turn number two. And here's a replay of it as we will be back more with more of the Valleydale 500 in a moment. What happened to uh, Bobby Allison's car? Nope. Jackie's Jackie's talking to uh, Robert Yates right now. Maybe he can find out what happened to Bobby Allison's car. Man, this race is going south. Everybody to slow down, and they all thought he said one lap to go, and they all doubled up. <laughs> yeah. All right, Daryl is one lap down, right? He's about three now, or four. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Nobody's had any good yet. That's not yours. This is yours. You just blew my eardrum. <laughs> it's better than they'll never know. <laughs> Ricky Rudd's in the pits with some. He uh, is my pick to win this race right now. No, we're going right to the. All right.
back at Bristol Tennessee in the Valley Dale 500 our first live second live telecast of 1985 and the uh, second of many this year on ESPN. We have had eight leaders in this race to this point. Harry Gant, Bobby Allison, Kyle Petty, Dale Earnhardt, Jeff Bodine, Rusty Wallace, Buddy Baker, and Sterling Marlin. Let's go to Jackaroo. We're here in the pits with Gary Nelson, who's the vice president in charge of things on pit road for the die guard team. Gary, first of all, let's go back to the caution when Bobby Allison stopped on the back stretch. Can you tell us exactly what happened? Well, it's the strangest thing. The uh, steering shaft going right right up behind the steering wheel broke. Uh, it's something we could change real quick. We sent a runner over there with another wheel, but uh, you know we lost several laps there, and what it did was it bent the ball joint. Uh, we lost several more laps changing the, the right front lower ball joint. Uh, we're still optimistic that we can have a good finish. Uh, we're going to do our best, and maybe we can still pull it off as, as crazy as things are happening today. Well, we checked with Phil Parsons, who came to the assistance of the number 22 Allison crew and provided the, the extra steering wheel. But then in this last pit stop, Gary, you looked to the outside of the car. What were you checking over there? Well, after a wreck like that, uh, we ran a few laps, and then another caution came out. We just came in. We didn't need to change tires, but we wanted to be extra sure that the car is safe. We want to make sure none of the fenders were loose or, or flapping or anything like that that could cause us or somebody else a problem. And I think we're in good shape for that. And Larry Newber is with another key player here on pit road. Let's go to him. Well, this is Bud Moore, Ricky Rudd's crew chief. Bud won the very first race ever held here as a crew chief. And today you look like you're in a pretty good position. Well, you know, they are pretty uh, rough out there. There's a lot of little, little slipping and sliding, but I think we are. Right. Bud right now is on the radio talking to Ricky. So far, things are going pretty routinely for them. They're very happy, by the way, that everything that's happened on the racetrack, Ricky, so far has been able to avoid. So the hopes are very high here in the Bud Moore Ricky Rudd pit. Well, Benny, last week during the late model sportsman race, it was pretty much a survival of the fittest in which Daryl Waltrip was uh, successful. And it looks like it could be that situation here this afternoon. It really does. I tell you what, if there, if anybody that inherits the lead or is running well has either hit the fence or someone else, with the exception of Dale Earnhardt, and he has power steering problems. So today has not been very lucky for anybody. Well, is winning a race strategy? Is it a good race car driver? Is it a good race car? Or is there also an element of luck involved? And that brings us to our question of the week for this week about superstitions. We're doing a question of the week on superstitions. Does Jeff Bodine have any superstitions? Uh, just not to worry about superstitions, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't really say that, I, that I'm superstitious. I just don't take any any extra chances of a uh, uh, black cat, ladders, and uh, money laying on the ground. I'm, I'm sort of peculiar about picking up a penny to tails down. Well, I don't know if you'd really call it a superstition, but and I noticed I walked up to the car. I haven't told the boys because it embarrasses them a little bit. But I really don't like my name on the car. I don't have anything that's green. Uh, yeah. I don't, Everything has a number 13 on it. Like if I go to the store and buy something, it ends up like $5.13. I'll buy something more extra just to change the 13. Or if I sign in at the registration, the pit pass has a 13. I won't sign in. I'll make them give me another one. And uh, just little things like that. Well, there is <laughs> Neil Bonnet, who will not give up the fight here this afternoon. Despite being in the wall twice, he is still out there. What about uh, superstitions with Benny Parsons? Oh, I don't know. I, I used to say, no, I'm not superstitious, but I'd carry coins that people would give me, and I had a couple of Buckeyes that people gave me to carry around. Uh, and I signed in in Atlanta this year and received pit pass 255. My race car number is 55, and I received, I think, uh, pit pass 255. I thought it was an omen. I finished eight. <laughs> Jackie Rudis was some, with uh, someone in the garage area. Jackie? Well, Benny, this driver might be a little superstitious today. Daryl Waltrip, you had the problem early, and now you're out of it. What finally knocked you out of the Valley Dale race? Well, I guess the engine blew uh, that time. I think I broke a rod or a crankshaft or something, but uh, not been a very good week for the Waltrip family. We've had a Stevie had a miscarriage on Wednesday, and uh, I guess you might say I had one today, not trying to be funny or anything, but uh, the day not, didn't go well for us and uh, hadn't been a very good week for us. Well, you can be sure that all of racing's hearts and prayers are with you and Stevie and your time. But your pick right now for the, for the winner, who's the toughest guy in the racetrack right now? Earnhardt. He's running really well, and uh, 
I, I, you know, he looks like he could have a real easy time of it. He's not got anybody to race with, and uh, my best, you know, hope he does well. And I'm around. I'd like to relief drive if anybody needs me. That's the story. Back to green flag racing. All right, Daryl, and we will see you in the Trans South 500 on ESPN next week at Darlington. And another car that has come back out onto the racetrack, Jeff Bodine has made repairs in that car and he is back out in the race. But Dale uh, Earnhardt is the leader right now with Richard Petty running second, Rusty Wallace is third, Buddy Baker fourth, and fifth is Bobby Hillen Jr. There's some debris down the first turn and we're going to have another caution play, yet another caution play for a piece of metal land down in the first corner. And it's just above the groove, and I hope that everybody can avoid hitting it. Lake Speed goes to the high side, so does Buddy Baker and Sterling Marlin to avoid that piece of metal in turn number one. It said Pontiac on it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so the crew will come out and get it off the racetrack, and we once again slow down for a caution period. 191 laps are completed. We'll be back in just a moment. Get about the 5:30 flight. This thing isn't going to be over by then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. right. <laughs> I need to see a race, but I don't think yeah. there's going to find one anywhere. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Who can we talk about? Um, I don't care. Just pick somebody. Rusty Wallace isn't doing too bad at all. No, he's running very well. As he's, a matter of fact. Yeah, he's second now since uh, since uh, Petty came in. Daryl's got to be nuts. Won't relieve somebody in this <laughs> comes out once again and we are back to racing out of the first 196 laps 62 have been run under caution. Earnhardt continues to set the pace now with Rusty Wallace running in second spot in the car. Dale Earnhardt's is Ron Bouchard. He's shown 53 laps down. Bill Elliott is right behind Rod Bouchard and he is 11 laps down. There is Ricky Rudd in car number 15, and he is in sixth position right now and moving up quickly. Well, he stopped on the last caution flag and changed left side tire, so he now has four fresh tires on his automobile. Dale Earnhardt did not stop, so you would think that Ricky Rudd for the next few laps anyway would have an advantage. The disadvantage is he's got about eight cars between he and Dale Earnhardt. Seven cars are on the lead lap. The battle now shaping up for second position. There is Sterling Marlin, Richard Petty, and Ricky Rudd, but right ahead of them, the battle for second involving Buddy Baker and Rusty Wallace. Baker has now moved into second spot in that number 80 oh. Oldsmobile and a car into the wall in turn two. That is Terry Labonte and Ken Schrader, I believe, also. That's correct. Excuse me, Bob. I, <laughs> I was watching those fellows when they crashed. And... Well, I heard a, a pop. Could that maybe vindicate the tire or something? No, or I was that they somehow got together and Schrader. He does have a right front flat. Yeah, he does. Yes, that could have been what you heard. So Schrader will move into the pit area. He was running in the, uh, the top 10, I believe. The caution flag is out again. Although we do not have any car that is stalled on the racetrack, the caution does come out because of the incident involving Ken Schrader and Terry Labonte. Actually, they just kind of 
got together and both of them into the wall slightly but both were able to continue nevertheless the caution flag is displayed by Harold Kinder the official NASCAR starter there must be the trucks going towards the second turn yeah. there must be some debris over there knocked off those cars the body in straight when they got together what is the world's record for caution flags well I don't know but this uh, could possibly be a, a world's record there is uh, Bobby Killen Jr. and the crew chief on this car is suitcase Jake Elder. He's with Larry Newber. Well, this is Jake Elder, who's been with a lot of teams in the last three or four years. And one of the guys that, of course, is hoping for a big surprise today is Bobby Hillen Jr. Things look like they're going pretty routine, Jake. Yeah, we just dodged all the wrecks. <laughs> we do it all day. We'll be all right. At this place, what is Bobby? saying on the radio is the car feeling pretty good feel pretty good yes well things look like I guess the word is routine Benny down here at least with Jake Elder he's right Larry if he can dodge the wrecks he'll be okay today you would think that a 21 a 20 year old driver would be in every accident that happens but today he's been doing a good job yeah. maybe he's got some lucky coins in his pocket today boy I'll tell you our superstition feature that we did this week is certainly timely because a lot of guys out there have had a lot of luck with them to avoid some of these accidents that we have seen. When Darrell Walter blew just a moment ago, hit the fence as he came off the racetrack, down the racetrack, Buddy Baker went by him, and he had to miss him just by inches. Inches at best. <laughs> there was a good look at Bobby Hillen Jr., the 20-year-old from Midland, Texas. We're still not halfway through this event, and we've had something like nine caution periods. We'll be right back. <laughs> Break up here. Would you uh, stop tape for about a half hour? you can join us for the running of the Valleydale 500 here at Bristol International Raceway brought to you in part by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by Levi Garrett Chewing Tobacco. Time after time, the quality comes through. And by Autolite Spark Plugs. If Autolite's on it, there's copper in it. Two hundred and seven laps completed. The leader is Rusty Wallace. Second position, Richard Petty. Ricky Rudd is third. Bobby Hillen Jr. is fourth. Dale Earnhardt is fifth. And we have a total of seven cars on the lead lap. And the green is about to come out once again. Rusty Wallace leads them down. Jeff Bodine, the car to the inside. He is several laps down because of a mechanical problem that he had earlier. They race down the back stretch and Wallace maintains the lead. We'll be watching Dale Earnhardt possibly moving up through the field once again. He has been the dominant car and driver combination in this race, really since Bobby Allison relinquished the lead early on. But another car that's looking very strong is Ricky Rudd. He is the fourth car in the line, number 15, running behind Richard Petty, Jeff Bodine, and Rusty Wallace. Kyle Petty joins that uh, five car freight train as they head down the back stretch. 
let's hope we can run several laps here without a caution so that we can really get a determination of who exactly is running strong. We know that Earnhardt is, but aside from that, they haven't really raced enough, Benny, to determine who might be able to give it a challenge. Exactly. It's a, it is an unknown as to who is the second best car here. Dale Earnhardt, we know, is the strongest car, but we got Rusty Wallace, uh, Ricky Rudd, Richard Petty, uh, Bobby Hillen. I don't have any idea which of these cars is the fastest. Who's going to be racing for second spot? Because let's face it, Earnhardt is racing for first. It's interesting, Benny, because of the seven cars that are on the lead lap, three of the drivers have never won a Grand National race. Rusty Wallace, Sterling Marlin, and Bobby Hillen Jr. So we could see a first-time winner here this afternoon. We're focusing in on Ricky Rudd, the fourth car in the line here. He is running third in the race. Richard Petty in second right ahead of him in the lap car of Jeff Bodine trailing the leader Rusty Wallace. You know Jeff Bodine right now probably could get by Rusty Wallace and go on except you know what's the point he's 50 laps down there really isn't any point in trying to wreck the car for the satisfaction of passing someone and we see in the very back end of the line the fifth car in line is Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt taking the high line and smoking the tires going through turn number two but he is on his way up through the pack once again. Kyle Petty has slowed down significantly. He was up there with the lead when the green came out about five laps ago but since has fallen off the pace considerably and now the leaders are about to uh, approach him and lap him. He had a pit stop just a moment. He had a flat tire had to go in the pits. He's back on the racetrack but as you mentioned about to be lapped by the leaders. There is the leader Rusty Wallace from St. Louis Missouri. He is 12th in the NASCAR point standings right now. He was 11th in this race last year and 18th in the second race here at Bristol last year and Dale Earnhardt moves to the inside of Ricky Rudd coming off of the corner and now those two are still battling side by side but Earnhardt now passes Ricky Rudd and Earnhardt moves back up into third position. He's the fourth car in the line here but in third. Car is really working. I wonder on the caution flash we'll have to talk to Jackie or Larry Nuber and see if they have been able to do anything for him in his power steering uh, during all these caution flags. Battle for fifth and sixth position involving Bobby Hillen Jr. and Buddy Baker. And those two have been racing together for quite some time. All day long. And that's three eights. That's a pretty good hand. <laughs> <laughs> if you're playing poker, why you got a pretty good shot away. And trouble. Sterling Marlin hard into the wall in turn number one. He hit it for a ton. The back end of the car and got up uh, on the wall. Benny looked to me and came almost uh, to the point of going over it. But the car slid down the banking and is now resting as you can see with half the car on the apron of the track and half in the grass. He did hit it hard. I did not see the action. I heard Ken Martin yell and I looked up and saw him as he come off the fence. Uh, we can see the black marks and uh, something must have happened going in turn one and he backed it right in the fence left rear hit very very hard and uh, Ken Martin who you mentioned who is doing the scoring and the spotting for us up here in the booth mentioned that he did indeed brush the wall coming down the straightaway so perhaps something let go in the car as it came down and then backed into the uh, wall very hard down in turn number one. Here's Larry Newman. Well this is Richard Petty coming into the pits of course a relatively routine pit stop under these conditions. And you know this race has been dedicated by many members of the crew to Horse Fisher. Now Horse who was known as Kraut around the racing circles passed away a little more than a week ago. He was the first oh you might call him the official factory truck driver for Grand National Stock Car Racing. Everybody knew the personality of Horse Fisher around the racetrack. He was buried earlier this week wearing his STP racing uniform and all the crew is remembering Horse and wouldn't it be nice to win for the crowd here today. Richard Petty his 400th Grand National start and is running an unofficially third position as we near the halfway mark and look at the career earnings of that man five million dollars <laughs> five million six hundred thirty seven thousand dollars to be exact. So Richard Petty of course has been carrying the STP colors for many years and along with that here's an STP pit stop. Okay. 
well. I hope you guys are enjoying this as much as we are. <laughs> yes, satellite people, you, uh, you're certainly getting... All right, I will. Kathy and Tammy uh, back in Indianapolis. Director Mike Wells, wife and child, we hope you're enjoying this, and everybody else who's watching on satellite. All those people over around the Newport News area. I hear Bodine and Harry Hyde bleeding. Yeah, 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 I do too, a little bit. Do we have the 95 wreck? I don't think they got it. Well, let me sit down again. Yeah, <laughs> might as well relax. We're going to be here a while. <laughs> Who are those, Ken? Yeah. Sir, that you on this your birthday today? Oh, just more of the same. <laughs> We've already covered the field already. <laughs> we haven't talked about Don Hume. No, we haven't talked about Don Hume. We haven't talked about Clark Dwyer. We haven't talked about. Uh, Yeah, we can talk about him, sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I, I, uh, I see Phil Parsons down in Earnhardt's crew. He must be hoping that Earnhardt gets bushed and they need a relief drive. Right? Yeah. All right, so I got to identify. One to go. Back here at the Valleydale 500 at Bristol International Raceway, I'm Jack Arute here in the pits, the back pits, in fact, and I'm with Sterling Marlin who brought out this last caution. Sterling, first of all, what happened with the Sadler Chevrolet? Well, uh, we going out in front shoot and uh, we blew a tire going in the number one corner and uh, you know what much can do just hang on ride it out but uh, you know the that auto shack Chevrolet is really running good today and uh, you know we felt like we had a chance finishing the top five so uh, you know we're not quitters we'll definitely be back. Describe your feelings though when you've had it all go up in smoke when you've had such an incredible run. It's just frustrating you just wish uh, you know it's not much you can do but come back next week and try it again. But well, we've gone back to green. Let's go up to Bob Jenkins and Benny Parsons. All right, Jackie, thank you. The green is out once again, and Earnhardt moves back out into the lead. Ricky Rudd now second. There is our leader, Dale Earnhardt. 21 cars are still on the racetrack. We have nine official champion race, and those nine that are out include Darrell Waltrip, Joe Rutman, Phil Parsons, Mike Potter, Sterling Marlin, who we just talked with, also, J.D. McDuffie is out of the race. Dave Marcus and uh, Tim Richmond is out, and so is Phil Good. Race for fifth and sixth position, Bobby Hillen Jr., who's been uh, racing with several drivers, and now he's hooked up in a battle with Rusty Wallace. Rusty Wallace passing just a moment ago, going in turn three, and I thought Rusty was going to spin trying to get underneath the eight car, but somehow the eight car is back in front of him again. If you are just joining us, and we are not quite halfway through this 500-lap race, we've completed 231 laps. We have seen numerous caution periods. In fact, we have had, I believe, now 11 caution periods for a total of 71 laps. 
And the some of the uh, caution periods have been for rather serious looking accidents. But nobody has been seriously injured. Uh, Neil Bonnet had what he described as his bell rung during the first accident of the afternoon. But he was able to get back out there on the track. In fact, is still out there in competition. So it's been an exciting afternoon. A very lengthy race even to this point, And we're not even halfway through yet. Well, some of the cars that have been knocked out of competition, they buy accidents. It's Joe Rutman, uh, Bill Elliott, Daryl Waltrip, Neil Bonnet, Bobby Allison, Harry Gant, Terry Labonte, Ron Bouchard, uh, and all Lake Speed. <laughs> you know, so folks, they, your favorite driver was here. He started the event today, but and there, some of these fellows are still on the racetrack, but several laps down after repairs on their cars. Fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth battling on the racetrack. There is Lake Speed in car number 75. Right ahead of him is the defending Winston Cup champion, Terry Labonte, car number 44. Both of those drivers are a few laps down to the field. Bobby Hillen and Rusty Wallace running to the inside, and looks like that both Labonte and Lake Speed will at oh. least try to pass. He got cut off there by Bobby Hillen. Lake Speed did as they got onto the back stretch. He had no Bobby Hillen had no idea that Lake Speed was on the <laughs> outside of him. Came off turn two. Up the racetrack he went. Dale Earnhardt, certainly the strongest car out there right now, running behind. Uh, Dale Earnhardt on the racetrack is Bill Elliott as they come down the straightaway here. There is Bill. You can see him uh, trailing the leader. He is now uh, at least, uh, I would say, 10 laps down. He may have made up a couple of laps, but still, Bill Elliott is well off the pace here. You know, looking at these cars right now, it's really hard to figure out if Dale Earnhardt is just is taking it easy. He's slowed down, or if Bill Elliott really is running as well as his car was capable of running. Uh, when the race started today. And I think just as important, uh, the question is, are uh, Ricky Rudd and maybe Buddy Baker and Richard Petty, who are in the top five, running as hard as they can run, knowing that we're not halfway done yet? Well, that's true, because there is 260 laps to go. We've only completed 240. It's a long ways. And Dale Earnhardt, some of these fellows might know, have has had a power steering problem. It may or may not be fixed. If it hasn't, 260 laps is a long way to drive the thing without power steering. It's been an up and down day for Kyle Petty. He ran uh, in the lead as a matter of fact at one point and stayed in the top five for a while but has had some uh, tire problems recently. Here's Larry Newber with more on that story. Well, Bobby has recently had some tire problems so when the day started out we had a flu situation. How is Kyle feeling in the cockpit Leonard? Well to start with he had a plug wire to come off and I uh, was skipping for a good while. Got him a lap down, and then uh, we got that fixed, and he got back out, and then he had a flat tire, so he got us behind again. But he's running pretty good right now. Leonard, there's also a lot of talk about the racetrack before the race began today. Anything from Kyle on the radio about the track digging up? No, the track was okay. Uh, we weren't having any problems until it started skipping. Well, this is Leonard Wood. He's been one of the pride and joys him and his brother Glenn for the Ford Motor Company for well, well over 20 years, Bob and Benny. Well, this is a good chance, uh, Benny, to talk more about this tire rule. We talked about it earlier, uh, and I don't think you ever said whether you're for it or against it. <laughs> well, I'm for it, really, because at Atlanta last fall, in a 25-lap period, Bob, there was three caution flags, and we changed 12 tires. And it's crazy. And for 37 miles, we put on 12 tires, three complete sets. At least with the caution flag, now we we've only would have put six tires in or half that. And I, I, I think it's a good rule, and it should save a lot of money in a year's time. Sure, there's some disadvantages, as Terry Labonte has found out. He goes in the in the pits a moment ago with a flat tire. He changed the rights, discovered he had a flat tire, so it's a two-lap penalty. But one of these days, that's going to happen to me. So therefore, leaving out. We're timing uh, Dale Earnhardt's lap here. You know, before the race started, we were looking down over pit road, and we, of course, were observing the tires that were uh, stacked up there, ready to be put on as Dale Earnhardt comes around and stops the clock at 18.2 seconds. 
So we'll see uh, how that compares to what uh, second place Ricky Rudd is running. We uh, unofficially uh, that's about 105.4 miles an hour right now. Here comes Ricky Rudd and we'll try to time this lap. That uh, added up to about forty five thousand dollars in tires that were waiting to be put on a race car. So uh, it is hopefully going to save uh, crews a lot of dollars during the uh, during the entire year. Well, last spring at Richmond Virginia in a 400 lap race on a half mile racetrack the competitors mounted and used seven hundred and ninety two tires. That's one hundred twenty five thousand dollars worth of tires. Yeah. So. Well Ricky Rudd is running just slightly faster than Dale Earnhardt on the track Ricky Rudd 18 point one one hundred and six miles an hour so he's closing in on Dale Earnhardt but again the question is are both of them running at the, the top of their capability. That's exactly right I would think just looking at the race right now I would think that both of them are, are kind of waiting to the 400 lap mark to try to get something going because there's no point in knocking the wall down right now as everyone else has. <laughs> That's exactly right. Earnhardt moving down the straightaway. Bill Elliott is still right behind him. Now Earnhardt moving to the outside of Ronnie Thomas from Christianburg, Virginia, in the Thomas Racing Chevrolet. Earnhardt with about a full straightaway length lead on Ricky Rudd. Several of the drivers that were involved in incidents earlier today, including Bobby Allison, Ron Bouchard, Lake Speed. Terry Labonte, Harry Gant are still out there on the racetrack, but uh, really not in a position to win this race. Uh, Jeff Bodine, another that falls into that category. And another uh, driver that we understand that is running just about as fast as anybody else out on the racetrack is Ron Bouchard, and you really wouldn't think that looking at the front end of the car. <laughs> well, that's what that's living proof that aerodynamics does not help you at Bristol, believe me, because he doesn't have any. They're all gone. Bouchard following Terry Labonte. Let's go down to Larry Newber once again in the pit area. Well, we are in Ron Bouchard's pit right now. This is Wayne Bumgarner, who is Ron's crew chief. Apparently, the car is working pretty good despite the modified effects in the front end, Wayne. Well, we've got a few things bent up. We've adjusted. It's not real bad. We're just kind of rest up race and we're gonna practice the rest of the day. How does Ron say the car is handling? I didn't hear you. How does Ron say the car is handling out there? Well, it's not bad. I mean, uh, we're bent up, you know. We feel like if we hadn't got in the wreck, we'd have been uh, back to the race. Of course, that's a, a big hit. Well, they were hoping for big things to happen here this week, Bob and Benny. They had a great week of practice, but apparently all goes for naught in the main event. Well, Ron may feel somewhat at home in this car. Of course, he's a former modified driver, open wheel driver, and uh, he's got open wheels at least at the front end of the car. That's right. If he could just put a little piece of sheet metal from the windshield down to the radiator, he would have a modified because his front tires is, is exposed to the world. You know, Benny, we have seen this uh, type of thing many times in the past few years. Cars that. Uh, take either the front end or the rear end of the car clear away but still stay out there on the racetrack. Is there a noticeable difference in the way the car handles without uh, body work on the front end or the rear end. Not really. It's just it's difficult to drive because of not having the fenders of the hood to go by. That's the only thing. But as far as uh, if the wheels are in place and the, the front end setting is like it's supposed to be that's really the things that makes a difference. And you know the reason that they're out there the people would say why is Ron Bouchard on the racetrack with a car like that because the Winston Cup championship is what they're all after. This is only the fourth or fifth race into the season so no one is defeated. They all have a chance. It pays to the winner a quarter of a million dollars. A lot of money. Bob. And two or three laps this early in the season could very definitely make the difference later on in the year. 261 laps have been completed. The leader is Dale Earnhardt. Ricky Rudd is running second. We'll be back with more of the Valleydale 500. I would like to announce to all satellite viewers, to all people in the truck, to all people in Bristol, Connecticut, we are now more than halfway through. Hey! <laughs> There's your 
there's your Piedmont Airlines going into Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, the cool weather certainly did not keep the crowd away from Bristol Raceway and the Valleydale 500 here this afternoon. We're at Bristol this weekend, next weekend on the 14th Sunday at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. We'll have live coverage of the Trans South 500 from Darlington International Raceway. Harry Gant, the defending champion there, but Darrell Waltrip, Ricky Rudd, Bobby Allison, Cale Yarborough, and Benny Parsons will be trying to move into victory lane next Sunday at 1 o'clock live here on ESPN. 271 laps have been completed. Here's the situation in the Valleydale 500. The leader is Dale Earnhardt. Second place is Ricky Rudd. Third, Buddy Baker. Fourth, Richard Petty. And fifth is Rusty Wallace. There are 21 cars still out there on the racetrack. Nine cars are out of the race, namely Darrell Waltrip, Joe Rutman, Phil Parsons, Mike Potter, Sterling Marlin, J.D. McDuffie, Dave Marcus, Tim Richmond, and Phil Good. All of those drivers out of the race. We have had numerous caution flags displayed over the racetrack and numerous accidents, but none of the accidents have been of any serious nature. They have caused, however, several of the favorites to be in a non-competitive situation here, namely Harry Gant, Lake Speed, Ron Bouchard, Bobby Allison, all of those cars have suffered body damage enough to, and uh, pit stops enough to keep them out of uh, a chance to win this race. So the continuing story here is that of Dale Earnhardt, Richard Childress, the crew chief. Here is Jack Aru. Richard, the main thing we want to know first, an update on the power steering condition. What have you been able to do, if anything? Nothing. We just checked it under the stop a while ago, and it's still got the belt on it. It must be something internally, so we're just going to have to leave it up to Dale. What about the fact that he's running just as bloody strong as he is already? We're, we're just over a little bit past halfway. Does he have anything left, or is that all she wrote? Well, he's right now, he's just running as comfortable as he can with the steering like it is, but it, it's a little tough when he gets in traffic. He's going to have to have two slings for his arms when he gets done today without any power steering. Yeah, it's just making tough. <laughs> well, that's the story from one tough customer's pit area back up to the tower. Still maintaining about a full straightaway length lead on uh, Ricky Rudd, however, at this time. Maybe a little bit more than that. Now, we gave you the top five just a few seconds ago. The only other car on the lead lap is Bobby Hillen, Jr. Two laps down in seventh position is Terry Labonte. Eighth position, also two laps down, is Lake Speed. And in ninth place is Kyle Petty. In 10th position, three laps down, is car 52 driven by Jimmy Means. In the 11th spot, five laps down, rookie Ken Schrader. In 12th position, six laps down, Ronnie Thomas. 13th place, eight laps down, is Eddie Bershwell. In 14th position, car number nine driven by Bill Elliott. He is 11 laps down. There is the number 41 of Ronnie Thomas running in 12th position. Ronnie normally runs very well at this racetrack. This is probably the worst I've ever seen him at this racetrack. He normally runs high and does a tremendous job. Today, evidently, he doesn't have it hooked up as well as I he has in the past. Second generation driver, his father, Jay Thomas, and Ronnie followed Jay around the racetrack many, many years. 
and four or five years ago started driving himself. This is his third race of the year. He did not compete at Daytona and did not compete at Atlanta. But at Rockingham he finished in 12th position. Uh, rather Rockingham he was 34th in Richmond. He was uh, the 12th place finisher. The 1978 Rookie of the Year on the Grand National uh, Circuit. Ronnie Thomas from Christianburg, Virginia. There's the leader Dale Earnhardt putting another lap on another rookie who is uh, this year going for Rookie of the Year honors himself Ken Schrader. And the leader is in quite a bit of traffic as a lot of slower cars are ahead of him. The car right directly in front of the leader is Jimmy Means in car number 52. While we're talking about rookies Eddie Birchwell from San Antonio Texas is also in the battle for Rookie of the Year honors. He's driving the number six DK Ulrich car. There he is down the back stretch. He's had a few problems this afternoon including a spin but nevertheless is still out there in the race. His father is a fellow named Don Birchwell from San Antonio Texas in 1972 73 was a Grand National owner. He finished fourth in the 1974 1973 Talladega 500 with a fellow named Clarence Lovell driving his car. Clarence went home back to San Antonio. They had a party for him on Tuesday night. On the way home, Clarence had an accident and was killed on the highway. And that was the last we saw of Don until Eddie has grown up and here he is on the racetrack again. And Don is back, very interested in his son's career. Well, Eddie has competed in a few races, but as I said, is in the battle for Rookie of the Year this year. And here are the Rookie of the Year point standings. Ken Schrader with 42, Eddie Birchwell with 22, and Don Hume, uh, this is only his second race here this weekend, has nine points. Jeff Bodine is once again behind the pit wall, and we'll raise him on the radio if we can, we do see Larry Newber down there at the uh, at the car, but let's raise Jeff on the radio. Jeff, uh, what's the problem this time? Bob, we we brought the rear end out again. What we've got is an aluminum cover on the front of our rear that holds the seal in, and the seal is coming out of that cover. Of course, that lets the grease out. Then we burn the rear end up. We're putting one of Tim Richmond's rear ends in the car now. It doesn't type of seal arrangement so that once we get that in it should last the whole race. Jeff why was the aluminum retainer just to save the weight. I don't really know Bob. Uh, I guess we'll find out when we get back to the shop. Uh, you know you always try to improve your equipment and I guess we uh, went a little too far with this deal and it's costing us. OK we'll see when you get back out there. And look. Yeah. Like For Harry, we got you. So he said that the only yeah. that's the only one they could buy was the aluminum style, and uh, was not trying to say wait, that's all was available. And we noticed that uh, Jeff enjoying an apple during his uh, pit stop. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Buddy Baker continues to run well here in car number 88. There he is, as you mentioned, uh, Benny uh, is uh, a part owner of this car this year. Well, you know, Danny Schiff was a sponsor for for a long time. And he was very interested in the racing business. He and Buddy Baker got together, and I think it's a good situation for both of them. And I think Buddy Baker would agree. And I think we have we have something on. Uh, oh, there's trouble right oh, in front of Baker. Right in front of Buddy Baker, Ronnie Thomas loops, and Richard Petty is also going to be involved in this incident. So another yellow. That's up in turn number two. Ronnie Thomas getting sideways right in front of Buddy Baker as we were talking about him. And the yellow does come out, although Ronnie uh, is able to gather it in and uh, continue on the racetrack. Just another caution play. Huh? <laughs> Just another caution. That's our 12th of the afternoon. And it means that Richard Petty is going to come in for a stop. And it could mean that several of the other leaders will be in for a stop. And we'll take another look at what happened. As we were talking about Buddy Baker and right ahead of him as they went into turn number two Thomas a little bit sideways. Well, it looks like that Ronnie just simply the car got away from him right there. He was not able to control it. And look at Buddy get on the brakes. <laughs> yeah. And Ronnie now Ronnie's got it locked down. But Buddy manages to get by on the outside. I don't think that Ronnie he and Ronnie made any contact whatsoever. 
but there was contact between Ronnie Thomas and Richard Petty as Petty nudged him in the front end just a little. I don't think there's serious damage. Richard Petty is pulling out of the pit area right now and we take a look as he goes back out on the track. There is some front end damage but it's not serious at all. Simply a love tab Bob. Bobby Allison also into the pits and now back out again. We're almost 300 laps into the 500 lap Valleydale 500 back in just a moment. Did Richard lose a lap? Yeah, he did. Yeah, one or two laps. All right. Okay. He's Pet back is in back again. in. Yeah. I was surprised at Button. All right. I thought you went both uh, wells then. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were there, though, buddy. That's right. <laughs> yep. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Jackie is with uh, Harrington. Uh, Bob. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Booby Harrington. Yeah. One to go. Back at the Valleydale 500 in Bristol, Tennessee. 300 laps even have been completed, and Buddy Baker had a narrow escape of a spinning Ronnie Thomas out in turn number two just a few laps ago. We're about to go green for the restart, but before that, let's go down to Jack Arood, who's with Buddy's crew chief, Booby Harrington. That's Rob Robert Harrington. It was a close call for Buddy Baker. What did he say to you on the radio? Well, he said it was uh, real close. He didn't know why he spun out, but he said, I swear I never touched him, so <laughs> we don't know here. Quick, go. You can hear him telling him, go, 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 go. We've gone back to green. Real quick, Robert, can you have, do you have more in the car? Can you catch Earnhardt by the end of the race? I don't think anybody's going to catch Earnhardt. Well, that's the story from your second place runner. All right. So, Buddy Baker escapes a spin and is still in the top five. As a matter of fact, he is still in third spot. Ricky Rudd is now the leader of the race, and Dale Earnhardt is second with Baker in third spot. Fourth is now Rusty Wallace. Uh, I don't, I think maybe uh, Bobby or uh, Bobby Hillen Jr. is now in fourth position, and uh, going a lap down right now, as a matter of fact, as they come down the straightaway is Rusty Wallace. That's exactly right. He was lapped just about 15, 20 laps before the caution. Uh, Rusty Wallace was put a lap down by Dale Earnhardt and now by Ricky Rudd. There is Buddy Baker in the number 88 Oldsmobile, the Bullfrog Nets liquid wrench Oldsmobile. And there is a difference being a driver and an owner. And we asked Buddy Baker about that situation. You know, the good part about it, I know whether the driver's given 100% or not. And uh, <laughs> I have this year. I've, I've tried very hard to establish the team. And, uh, you know, a couple of years from now, I won't be doing the driving. But right now, I feel that I'm very competitive. And uh, at least uh, it, there's no, as you say, between the car owner and driver, there's no problem between us. Uh, we both speak the same language. Buddy Baker from Charlotte, North Carolina. We've had nine leaders in this race, and Bill Elliott has moved around Ricky Rudd to get another of his laps back. And uh, Ricky.
Kentucky right now finds Dale Earnhardt once again moving in on him as Baker continues to run in third spot. There is Bill Elliott and there is Ricky Rudd. And a car smoking badly coming down the straightaway may have had some contact with the outside wall. That's Don Hume. And Hume moves to the apron of the racetrack in turn number two. I think he's going to make it to the pit area and no caution. But Don Hume has damage to the right side of that race car. Looks like he made contact with the outside retaining wall and the right front tire was flat. I don't know if that's what caused the contact or once he made contact the right front tire went flat. And there is a look at Don Hume the driver who hails from Charlotte North Carolina. And Don Hume in the battle for rookie of the year. And they have uh, found some sponsorship on that car. Uh, the Harper Corporation of America is uh, sponsoring that car. They manufacture a heavy duty hand cleaner. So it's Catherine Harper's Clean Hands Formula race car. I read the other day that that's a five year deal. That is correct. That is yes. a five year contract. Yeah. So uh, Don's career certainly uh, given a boost by the fact that he was able to secure that uh, nice sponsorship. Where did Ricky Rudd come from? I mean, all of a sudden he wasn't able to outrun Dale Earnhardt. Now Earnhardt cannot gain on him. Well, Earnhardt's a, a half a straightaway behind him, not gaining right now. You're absolutely right. And again, the question is, is he trying or is that the way it is? I'll tell you, Rudd has looked very strong to me all race long, not as strong as Dale Earnhardt, but I think Ricky Rudd has a real good shot of winning this race if he can uh, stay out of trouble. Well, you said that earlier on during one of the breaks, Bob, and I wondered about that, but I'll have to agree with you. It looks like he really has an opportunity. Plus, I think it, oh Harry Gant spins coming off the fourth corner off the fourth corner Gant spins and bumps the inside wall and another yellow flag comes out liquid has poured from that race car and that's going to mean the crews out on the track and probably a lengthy caution period. Well we have seen several cars uh, Benny come down off of turn number four and spin to the inside of the track. Could it be that uh, slick spot up there in turn four that Jack Aroot uh, touched on at the very beginning of the program. Bob I've been watching that corner that spot up there and it looks like it healed up once the race got going it, it appears to me as though that spot healed up and I don't really foresee any having any problem. With it. Well they worked very hard on that spot up there in turn number four during the week it began to uh, break up a little bit last weekend when we were here and they worked very hard to get it uh, back in shape and I, I agree with you it looks like it is holding very very well there is Richard uh, Petty in the pit area they are changing rubber on the left side of that race car and the windshield is being wiped off for Richard Richard lost two laps when he was involved in that incident with Ronnie Thomas a few laps ago the leader Ricky Rudd pulling back out onto the racetrack and and the Dale Earnhardt, who's in second position, also pulls back out onto the speedway. All right, so another caution period with 315 laps completed. This because of a Harry Gant spin in uh, turn number four onto the main straightaway. And as you can see, Harry has pulled into the pit area to get some fresh rubber on that car. While we're yellow, we'll take this break and be right back in Bristol. Yes, of course he does. What the record is for caution flags? If he doesn't know, he has it in his briefcase. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm sitting right next to him. Oh, now there's an interesting shot. What is that, Benny? And then do you want me to lead into the feature? That's the water overflow. Neil, where's the where's the throw after the ISO?
as you rejoin us, the green flag comes out once again. Ricky Rudd and Dale Earnhardt go down the back stretch now with Ricky Rudd leading by about three or four car lengths. But now Dale Earnhardt begins to move in on Ricky Rudd, and I think we're going to have a new leader in the next two laps. Benny, we've been waiting for 150 laps for a race. I think we're going to see one. I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> May have our first uh, real serious racing here. It's been mostly crashing and banging in one yellow caution period after another. But now I think we're going to get out to some real serious racing. Earnhardt moving in on Ricky Rudd as Clark Dwyer in car number 64 is right ahead of this duo on the racetrack. Clark just pulled out of the pit area and now is being lapped once again. Both cars will go to the high side or will they? Yes, they do. Coming out of turn number four. Both are able to get around Clark Dwyer. Clark Dwyer was, Dwyer was black flagged for illegally passing on a caution flag a moment ago. He had to duck in the pits and that's one reason he was in the pits. Only three cars are on the lead lap besides these two. Buddy Baker is on the lead lap. Then in fourth position, one lap down is Rusty Wallace, and in fifth, also one lap down, is Bobby Hillen Jr. Dale Earnhardt racing with Ricky Rudd. And Dale cannot make the pass, at least at this point. By the way, Jeff Bodine is back out on the racetrack. However, doing extensive work on that car. There's Jeff Bodine, by the way, as the leaders pass him on the back stretch. Jeff, who's been in and out of the pits many, many times and was involved in uh, one of the accidents early on in the race, but that Levi Garrett Chevrolet still out there in competition. Well, Dale Earnhardt uh, appears content at this point to stay back there in second place, Benny. Is that of his choosing, or can he not make the pass? I, I think that it's uh, of Ricky Rudd's choosing. I think Ricky <laughs> is keeping him back there. I believe that, that Earnhardt would be in front if he could because you know, there's always a chance that the 15 car is going to blow an engine and you're going to be involved in action as we saw today when the 27 Tim Richmond blew. But I, I think right now Ricky Rudd is about as good as Dale Earnhardt and it may be because of the power steering. Earnhardt may be worn out trying to wrestle that car around the racetrack and his arms may be just weary. Pit stops are always an exciting part of any competition. Here's Jack Root with more on that. Well, Bob, pit stops indeed are very important. And one of the most important areas is in the Jackman. And there you see we've isolated the Bullfrog Racing Team. Their Jackman is, is Buddy Baker came in for the pits. Now he's carrying that jack, and that weighs about, oh, anywhere from 70 to 150 pounds. He's got to hit the mark perfectly under the car, then begin to pump up, 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 because he's got to get the wheels up off the ground high enough so that the tire changers can remove the tires, remove the lug nuts, put on the new tires, and he's also got to check to make sure that they've got enough lugs, and then he drops the jack. Let's go back up to you, Bob. All right, Jackie. Well, the tool that each individual jack man uses very often is of his own creation, and here is more on that. One piece of equipment that's standard on all Winston Cup Grand National pit crews is the jack but it's a lot different than the one we're looking at here that you could buy at your local auto parts store. Watch how hard and how many times you have to pump to get the car up off the ground. Well, that'd cost just too much time on pit road, especially during a green flag stop. So what the teams do is they take a race day jack and they work it into a finely tuned piece of equipment. The first first place that they take a look at is down here in the cylinder area with these jacks. They remachine them and rework them so it'll take only three to four pumps to get a car sufficiently up off the ground to change two outside tires. That's the type of jack we see here with the Tim Richmond crew in the old Milwaukee Pontiac. They're their jack has got four wheels on it and looks very standard. When you move to Richard Petty's STP Pontiac jack, you see they've added a handle and foregone the wheels in the front to add some frontal stability under the car. As we move down to Joe Rutman's crew, they've decided that they need the handle, but they don't need wheels at all, and they slide the jack around on the tarmac on pit road. As we go to the Bill Elliott jack, you notice that they've drilled a lot of holes in it. That's to lighten the jack up and make it a little less cumbersome when it comes over the wall. But probably the best jack that we've seen here at Bristol is the jack that's used by the 7-Eleven team with Kyle Petty at the control of the Wood Brothers Ford. You'll notice that it looks a lot like the Coors Melling jack. However, there's one very important difference. All of the holes here, the handle, no wheels, but it's made out of solid aluminum. 
much lighter than any of the jacks we've seen on pit road should make for much faster pit stops especially in green flag conditions. You know I got to give credit where credit is due on the jack situation that cylinder that Jackie said that the teams redesigned and what have you that's there is a company in St. Joseph Michigan called Auto Specialties Company that does make the power units for those jacks and have been making for the past 12 15 years then the guys take that power unit and make all sorts of you know aluminum jacks jack to no wheels and what have you but the power unit is a piece that you can buy by. Well essentially nothing uh, has happened since we uh, left for that little feature on the jack with Jack Aroot. <laughs> Ricky Rudd continues to be the leader and Dale Earnhardt running just behind him keeping him in sight but not passing at this point. There are a couple of people that we would like to thank for their uh, hospitality and their graciousness while we've been here in the Bristol Tennessee area on two weekends last weekend of course the rain out and the late model sportsman race and today's running of the Valley Dale 500 Larry Carrier and Ted Jones and everybody else associated with Bristol International Raceway. We thank you for your hospitality and uh, we look forward to the night race that we'll be bringing you live on ESPN later this summer. Side by side Dale Earnhardt and Ricky Rudd. Earnhardt has the lead. They ran across Ernie Birchwall come, coming off the second corner. One went inside. Earnhardt went outside and Earnhardt ended up in the lead. Now we'll see if he can pull away from Ricky Rudd and that might tell us if indeed Earnhardt is the far superior force in this race. Ooh, he looks like he may have had some slight contact with Clark Dwyer there and again one goes one way and another goes the other. Tell you what these fellows are really racing in uh, the slower cars. It's hard to imagine just how fast they go around this racetrack. These fellows Earnhardt and Rudd are going at it tooth and nail right now. We have had 15 lead changes and nine drivers have held the lead so far but Dale Earnhardt has led most of the way Richard Childress of course the crew chief and let's go down to Larry and an update the situation involving the power steering and other problems that might be plaguing Dale Larry. Well other problems maybe but right now they're feeling kind of confident in this Richard Childress himself used to be a former Grand National driver Richard Dale's out there fighting without any power steering is he getting tired at least will he admit it. Well, right before that last caution he was, whenever he get in traffic, he has to work pretty hard. Other than in traffic, he says, it, you know, it, it ain't that bad, but it's pretty hard. Are you guys showing us all you have right now? Are you faster than Rudd? Can you determine that? Well, right now, he's, I told him just save himself and run a pace where he could. So he's doing like, like, uh, like we want him to right now. Well, Benny and Bob, it looks like either neither Ricky Rudd or Dale Earnhardt made that decision. This guy, Richard Childers, made the decision. Ricky Rudd has a problem right now. He really doesn't need to be behind Earnhardt because he has no grill. You can yeah, see right. the front of his car, the grill is gone. He has no screen over that car. And I think that Larry or Jackie, if, if someone could go down and check with Bud Moore, uh, what and find out what happened to his grill because right now Earnhardt could throw a stone or something back and break the radiator on that automobile. You're absolutely right and I had uh, not noticed that until uh, you mentioned it so it, it probably did happen uh, just a few laps ago. So Rudd continues to run behind Dale Earnhardt as we still have a hundred and fifty three laps to go in this race. Three cars on the lead lap. Besides the two on your screen, Earnhardt and Rudd, the third car is Buddy Baker. Fourth, Rusty Wallace, and fifth is Bobby Hillen Jr. Well, he's not moving away from Rudd, though. There's uh, been no real daylight opened up between the two. Well, right now we've had a rash of caution flags all day, Bob. If this race were to go green flag the rest of the day, I think Ricky Rudd will win the race because I think Earnhardt would wear out without power steering. If there's a couple more caution flags, yes, Earnhardt can win the race. Well, the longest period that we have gone without caution in this race, 68 laps, that occurred between laps 227 and 295. So let's go down once again to Larry Duber. Well, this is Bud Moore, Ricky Rudd's crew chief. Bud, uh, Benny Parsons was speculating that maybe you guys are watching the fact that you have no grill in the car. Ricky has to lead. Is that a factor? Well, I didn't quite understand the question you asked me. The car's running real well right now, and uh, looks like we got it hooked up pretty good, so we're looking forward to the, toward the end of the race. 
as Ricky speculated as to whether or not he is faster than Earnhardt out there right now. Well, Earnhardt is our main competition. It's going to be hard to outrun him, but I feel like it's uh, down toward the end. We'll work on him real hard. Well, when it comes to the category of years of experience, Benny and Bob, you've got to look to this guy right here. He's been around, oh, a couple of years. Since about 1960, as a matter of fact, Larry. <laughs> Till Bud, I said good luck. Let's go to uh, Jackie Root at the other end of the pit area, who's with Ronnie Thomas. And a, and a cruel twist of fate for Ronnie Thomas. Ronnie, we understand that you've been fined $200 by NASCAR for, for profanity. Well, that's what they say. At a, what I understand, NASCAR said I give him a finger. I was thrown up, but they was only supposed to penalize me one lap, and they penalized me two laps, said for passing uh, the leader something on the caution. You know, it's... Uh, well, what do you do now? It's a tough break for an independent like you. Yeah, well, you know, nobody's making me do it. Uh, it's a tough game, and uh, the bad thing about it, this thing, uh, if you ain't got a million dollars to play this game, you don't get to call your own shots. If you got a big sponsor and a lot of bucks, you can uh, do things a little bit more while you're away on the track, but when you're a little guy like me and ain't got much, you get pushed around a lot. Well, that's the way an independent sees it here on the backside of pit road. Well, that's an interesting observation, Benny, and we might talk about that. Uh, is it a million-dollar game that we're dealing with here? Oh, yes, it is a million-dollar game. That's exactly what it costs to play. Uh, but there's some guys out there without a million dollars who is doing the job. Uh, I'll tell you what Cody Thompson is going to do. He's going to give her $200, and he's going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely right. All right, there are the first two, Dale Earnhardt and Ricky Rudd. Buddy Baker is running third, then Rusty Wallace and Bobby Hillett. 357 laps completed. We'll be back with more in a moment. That was a classic comment there. That was, that was great. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Speedy Weeky, huh? As Mikey says. All right. Okay. We invite you to join us every Thursday evening at 7.30 p.m. for Speed Week, an update on the world of auto racing all over the United States. Every Thursday night, Larry and Uber and I will give you the news for the world of auto racing and the results from the world of auto racing speed week and dale earnhardt got sideways up in turn number four a half a lap ago or now almost a lap ago and uh, ricky rudd moved into the lead again we'll take a look at the uh, half spin that dale earnhardt did he's on the outside of ken strader he's lapping ken strader going in turn three. Oh, they touched they just touched his inner turn three that happened to me in 1979 with 15 laps to go but I didn't save it. I went all around <laughs> and finished fifth that day and had a lead with 15 laps to go. Now I've had 16 lead changes among nine drivers in this race with a little over 100 laps to go, about 136 or so. We have had a total of 14. How many, how many caution periods have we had? We've had 13 caution periods for a total of 82 laps. And we have about 18 cars still out there on the racetrack. But many of the favorites drop from the wayside very early, including Daryl Waltrip and Ron Bouchard and Neil Bonnet and all those. Some of those drivers are still out there. Their chances of winning this race were eliminated early. Many, many caution flags, many accidents, and a couple of accidents that have uh, resulted in hard contacts with the wall, but no injuries in this race. That was a pass for fifth place there. Terry Labonte was able to move into fifth spot and put Bobby Hill Jr. back to sixth. 
And Lake Speed is also in the battle, and he now moves into six spot, and Dillon moves back to seven. That's how to lose money real fast, isn't it? Yeah, but we're beginning to see, Benny, that some of those drivers that we just talked about, some of those who uh, lost several laps in the early stages of the race, like Lake Speed and Terry Labonte, are now up into the top five, and Richard Petty. Exactly. Well, and all the cars, not only did they have, they just had minor problems as compared to some of their competitors. Harry Gant, Neil Bonnet, Bobby Allison, Darrell Walter. Uh, these fellows, the 44 Terry Labonte and Lake Speed, they've only lost four or five laps to some of their competitors. Uh, 50 laps now. Rudd with about a seven or eight car length advantage on Dale Earnhardt as they go down the straightaway and put another lap on Kyle Petty. Ricky Rudd. I think about a year ago about this time when Ricky was shaking off the effects of a horrendous crash during the uh, running of the Bush clash at Daytona International Speedway but then came back in the very next race to win it at Richmond Virginia and he finished in uh, seventh position in the Winston Cup points last year and is currently 11th in the point standings this year. One of the most unbelievable acts of courage or, or the things that I have witnessed in Grand National Racing was Ricky Rudd in Daytona. As you mentioned, in the Bush Clash, he flipped, I don't know, seven, eight times. It was really a violent crash. He spun at 190, 200 miles an hour and went through the air up and down. Uh, the concussion, he, his eyes swelled tremendously, and they swelled shut. Bud Moore and the crew had another car, had a second car at the racetrack, and on Tuesday they had it ready to go. Ricky Rudd's eyes were swelled together. Yeah, he took that. tape <laughs> and and took and took his fingers, spread his eyes, and then taped the lower lids down so that he could see to drive the race car. That is uh, an act of courage, as you said, and uh, certainly points up the fact that race drivers enjoy doing what they're doing. Uh, you know, and there, there's somebody did a piece on the fact that race car drivers do play hurt, just yeah. like football players, and that's a prime example. Rusty Wallace is now running right ahead of Ricky Rudd on the racetrack, and Rusty is in fourth place, but he's about to go two laps down. Let's go down to uh, Jack Arute, who's with Dale Bryant, the uh, crew chief on the car. Jack? Daryl, you've got to be pleased with the run so far for Rusty Wallace today. Yeah, we're real pleased, though. We got well off our just a little bit while ago. We got a lap down, but the car has real worked good all day. The Iowa Guard, is, we're doing pretty good with it. How tough is it to take a young kid like Wallace and put him on a brutal racetrack like this one? Well, it's pretty tough because you know, you got to concentrate on 500 laps instead of maybe 200 laps. So you really got to keep your driver you know, really working well all day to keep him up there. Well, Daryl Bryant has been checking the watch each and every time and apprising his driver as to what his times are. So it's been a good afternoon for the Allegard team. Here's Rusty Wallace, and he has had two top ten finishes already this year, the Daytona 500 eighth and a ninth place finish at the Rockingham 500. And he has just gone two laps down here at Bristol, but maintaining the fourth place standing. There is Dale Earnhardt, who is running in second spot, and he has definitely not been able to move up on Ricky Rudd since that little incident down there in turn number three in which he uh, had contact with Ken Schrader and uh, did a half spin. A moment ago, Bob, I talked about Ricky Rudd playing hurt in Daytona last year. My hat's off to Dale Earnhardt because I know how difficult a time he's having out there without his power steering working properly. And the fact that he's still able to get around this racetrack at all, much less have a shot to win this race, is incredible. And uh, he is one tough customer, there's no doubt about it. The Wrangler, his sponsor, uh, their advertising promotion, is, that's what they say about Earnhardt. He's one tough customer. <laughs> I believe everything they say after today. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Battle for sixth and seventh position on the racetrack. It is involving Lake Speed in car number 75 and Richard Petty in number three. Richard Petty's 400th career Grand National start has not been all that uh, successful for him. But I'm sure that Richard Petty will be in the winner's circle again before his career is over. He has led this race, but uh, not for very long. And right behind Richard Petty is uh, Bill Elliott. Been around a long time, you know, since 1971 was the last time that Richard Petty missed a race. I think it was Macon, Georgia in the November. He decided not to go to that event, and that was the last event that he's missed. For a long time, uh, Richard and I were tied 
for consecutive races. And then in 1982, when I missed the Firecracker 400, I think it was like 317 straight races I had competed in. Richard has went on and completed in uh, 83 more since then. Competed in. It's amazing. The man is 47 years old, and he still goes at this sport just like he did 25 years ago. And this is his 963rd career start, 400th consecutive start, but his 963rd career start, and he has won 200 times. Richard Petty from Randleman, North Carolina, in the STP Pontiac, and here is another track fact. The drivers will tell you that the 35, 36 degree banking here at Bristol are as demanding on them body wise as any track on the circuit. Now, this little invention here, this tether, it's not an option, it's a requirement at this racetrack. The drivers fight fatigue all day long. This tether connects the helmet and underneath the armpits. And in a long race like this, particularly the last 100 laps, it's the only way to keep your head on straight. And even that isn't enough because the strain here on their neck is unbelievable. And I've tried all kinds of different things, you know, bungee cords and other straps, but that strap that you just saw on Larry Newbers is the only one that really works well. 388 laps completed, and the lead is held by Ricky Rudd. We'll be back with more of the Valleydale 500 from Bristol International Raceway. It in the corner, lets it go up. Is that right? Let whoa, 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 back stretch. Blake again. And, and Richard. Elliot. Is it Richard? There's some car down there on the inside. That's Bill Elliott, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Kept him a lap down, too. Some very important pit stops. Yep, Rudd got out first.
<laughs> well, Terry Labonte is going to have the lead. Terry Labonte will have the lead after the day. Well, if he finishes the race, he's fifth right now. Last year's champion, that's right. Do you have a rundown, Ken? Kind of. Who did? Jenkins, Benny Parsons, Jack Arood, and Larry Newber back at Bristol International Raceway for the Valleydale 500. 104 laps to go, and we are about to go green once again. The most recent caution period brought about by a spin over the backstretch involving Lake Speed, Bill Elliott. And here comes the green back to racing once again. All of the leaders came in for a pit stop. Ricky Rudd won the battle out of the pits, and he continues to maintain the lead with Dale Earnhardt running in second spot. Rudd got a tremendous jump that time. He stood on the throttle back a little before the other drivers were expecting it and got a tremendous jump on Earnhardt. But, but this <laughs> caution period that we just finished in five or six laps was probably enough to relax Dale Earnhardt enough that he's uh, raring to go again. And in fact, right now, as you can see, is moving in on Ricky Rudd. Well, I would think that it was has got to be getting weary by now. It looks to me like I've been watching his line around the racetrack. It looks like that Earnhardt is not driving the car through the turns, but is more or less letting the car go where it wants to in the corner and then doing a little steering as he comes off the turns, trying to save his arms as much as he can. Jeff Bodine, an up and down day, mostly down for him, really. He's still out there on the racetrack in competition. As a matter of fact, Jeff Bodine is the leader of the Winston Cup point battle going into this fifth race of the season. He has 618 points. Neil Bonnet second with 588. Terry Labonte third, Darrell Walter fourth, and Bill Elliott fifth. And the point standings are going to be scrambled because uh, most of those top five are not going to pick up very many points. Probably the body is going to be coming out uh, looking better than anybody else. I would think that Terry Labonte will end up leading the Winston Cup champion ship after today last year's champion so he he by now oh there Earnhardt is going by rush sure coming is. off the second corner going to the inside Earnhardt looking for the lead they go into three almost side by side traveling at well over 110 miles an hour Earnhardt inside and run outside but Rudd holds off the challenge and now we are less than 100 laps from the finish I think Benny those cars are pretty equally uh, powered and uh, able to run about the same speed it looks like they are it looks like the Earnhardt is really getting through turns three and four much better than Rudd but Rudd seems to have it about the same advantage up in one and two it's a Mexican standoff right now. who knows it's Ford against Chevy Ricky Rudd in the Ford and Dale Earnhardt in the Chevrolet right now the Ford is the leader but look at again, going low on the racetrack in turn number four and onto the straightaway but Ricky Rudd able to hold off the challenge as close as these two cars are right now, my money's on Buddy Baker. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Buddy is now a lap down, but is still in third, and who knows? We've seen stranger things happen in this race today so far. That's as, as close as these cars are. Uh, uh, Kenny Schrader and Lake Speed got together coming up the fourth corner, but we're going to watch the race for the lead right now between Ricky Rudd and Dale Earnhardt, and it is a barn burner. It is indeed. We mentioned that uh, Buddy Baker is third. Children. There goes Earnhardt. <laughs> Whatever his name is, the three car. Well, again, not really successful in uh, moving into the lead. Side by side on the corner again, but Rudd pulls away coming down the straightaway. Now they have a slower car in front of them that may mean the difference here. That's a Clark Dwyer, but they're going to pass him on the back stretch. At least Ricky Rudd is, and uh, Earnhardt also able to pass him just going into turn three. 
some good race here between Richard Petty and Lake Speed. Richard Petty right now has the position. Lake Speed, the number 75 car, and Kyle Petty getting a little loose and going to the inside and really slowing up things. Harry Gant hard on the binders off of the fourth corner. That was a mess. It started to be a mess. I'll tell you that. Kyle started to pass Richard, lost the car, and did a tremendous job saving. Got on the flat part of the racetrack, and really, I don't know how he saved the car down there, but he did. He just had to slow the car down tremendously, which uh, Lake Speed, Harry Gant, the rest of them almost ran over him. Well, Lake Speed is currently eighth in the point standings, that number 75 nationwide Pontiac. Well, Lake Speed was the leader of the Winston Cup points early on in the season. He has two top five finishes this year, of course, was second in the Daytona 500, was fourth at Rockingham, and was tenth at Richmond. So it's been a fairly successful season so far for Lake Speed, although his luck hasn't been all that great here this afternoon. He was involved in the very first accident of the race up in corner number three. That's exactly right, and that sponsor was Nationwide. That's an auto parts team. Yeah, Nationwide out of Columbus, Ohio. Here we are, Ricky Rudd, Dale Earn. Those folks are still bumper to bumper. They are indeed, and uh, 413 laps completed now, so we are in uh, nearing the final stages of this race. They will both be able to go the distance now without a pit stop if there are no more caution periods. And by the way, we have broken a record for caution periods here at Bristol. The record was 12. We've had 14 so far this afternoon. And the NASCAR Grand National record is 17. I hope we don't break it. So do I. So we will be back with more of the Valleydale 500 from Bristol International Raceway with Ron and Earnhardt battling for the lead. We'll do this later. Starting position, graphic.
about 70 some laps to go. Thank you for joining us here at Bristol International Raceway for the running of the Valleydale 500 for Grand National Cars. And this is not only a .533 mile oval, there are also other facilities here at Bristol International Raceway. Here's Jack Aroot. Bristol International Raceway is more than just a stock car facility. Located at the crossroads between Tennessee and Virginia, it has a little something for everyone. Nestled behind the half-mile Bristol facility that runs the Grand National Cars, and well within earshot, is the world headquarters for one of the best sanctioning bodies in drag racing, Larry Carrier's International Hot Rod Association. All of their activities take place right in that building behind me. But also within just a few short steps of this facility is one of the racetracks that they sanction with some of drag racing's best competitors competing on the quarter mile at speeds well in excess of 200 miles per hour. The whole shots just thunder through the valley here and some of the best blinding speeds you'll see in any drag racing facility occur right at Thunder Valley Dragway. It certainly is a different sight when the bleach boxes are empty and the starters Christmas tree lights have been put up till the next event. Directly behind me, you'll see the quarter mile drag strip, and beyond that, the runoff area. But something's a little different about Thunder Valley Dragway. There's a right hand turn at the end of that runoff area. The reason? Well, there was a mountain in the way, and it would have taken too much dynamite to go through it, so they went around it. You want to bust some Bronx? Well, you can do just that behind Bristol Raceway as well, at the Thunder Valley Stables and Showgrounds. Now, the barns behind me are where they house Arabian show horses that are sold periodically here. And in front of us, right here across this fence, is a rodeo stadium where they bring in some of the best professional rodeo riders to the southeast, right here within earshot of Winston Cup Grand National Racing. The entire Bristol facility is such a wonderful melding together of horses and rodeos and drag racing and Grand National stock car racing. You name it, it's here at Thunder Valley. And the thing that's most impressive to me is the cleanliness. The whole place is just so spotless. Well, almost. Back to you, Bob. Fortunately, Jackie was assigned to the pit area today, and the worst he had to step in was oil. <laughs> But anyway, we again salute the uh, hospitality of the people associated with Bristol International Raceway, Larry Carrier, Ted Jones, and everybody else. And what we have is an excellent race going on here with uh, 438 laps completed. It's still anybody's race, but Ricky Rudd leads Dale Earnhardt right now. Here's an interesting uh, graphic concerning the starting position of the race winners. 12 times the pole position winner has won the race. On nine different occasions, the driver who started second has won. And uh, seven different occasions, the third place starter has won, so on down the line. Now, Ricky Rudd started this race in six spots, so we could very definitely add a six to uh, the number of drivers who have started from six position. There you can see seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Basically speaking, the further up front you start, the better your chances are. But Dale Earnhardt started this race in 12 spot and certainly has a good shot at winning. He sure does. I think that the number one spot has been swayed by Junior Johnson's success over the years because Darrell Walter, his driver for the last three or four years, and Kale Yarborough, his driver for the five. Oh, oh look at this. Earnhardt is look alongside this. him. Oh, they, they keep, touch. They touch. But Earnhardt still cannot get around Ricky Rudd. Now they're again side by side in the corner, but Rudd with the advantage as they come off the corner and go down the straightaway, and we have seen that numerous times here in the last 50 or so laps. Rudd with the advantage off the corner and down the straightaway. He's really getting a good shot off that corner when he does run the high groove. Well, we 
don't know everything that's going on in that Dale Earnhardt car, but from what we know at this point, I think we would have to say that if Dale Earnhardt does lose this race, one of the very important factors was the fact that he did lose the power steering. I would think so, and if he does win the race, uh, my, I think he's to be more than congratulated for winning the race, but for the toughing it out and, and being able to drive around for all these laps with no power steering. But that's certainly taking nothing away from Ricky Rudd, who has had an outstanding afternoon and right now continues to lead. We'll be back with more from Bristol International Raceway and the Valleydale 500 in just a moment. and he has reported that several times since that last pit stop, Dale Earnhardt has complained on the radio that his right arm is going to sleep. So they are conserving as much as they possibly can. And according to Childress, they're just making selective stabs at the lead. So we'll just have to wait and see until maybe the last 10 or 15 laps to see if the stab technique will work here for Richard Childress and Dale Earnhardt. All right, so uh, our observations confirmed by Richard Childress. Rudd with now a five or six car length advantage on Ricky on uh, Dale Earnhardt. Well, the track conditions down in turn number four really have not deteriorated that much. At the beginning of our program, we talked about turn number four and the fact that the sealer was coming up in that area and could play an important role in this race. But Benny, I really don't think it's been uh, a factor here. It's held very well. Neither do I, Bob. I think you're exactly right. The racetrack has not been a factor. What has been a factor? Just good, hard, close racing. And the cause of that, is, the reason for that, has caused a lot of accidents. We, uh, a lot of cars have been torn up, but yet we still here we are with uh, 45, 50 laps to go, and we still have a race. Ricky Rudd, Dale Earnhardt. And Right now, who knows who's going to win? I certainly don't, and I don't think either one of those guys do. I don't think so either. Running in third spot, two laps down is Buddy Baker. Then fourth is Terry Labonte. In fifth spot is Rusty Wallace. Sixth position, three laps down is Richard Petty. In seventh is Bobby Hillen Jr. Eighth position, four laps down is Kyle Petty. In ninth is Lake Speed. 
tenth position, six laps down, is car number 52, driven by Jimmy Means. And in eleventh position, seven laps down, is Kent Schrader in the number 40 Ultra Seal Ford. Kent, of course, from Benton, Missouri. So we have now less than 40 laps to go, and Rudd continues to hold on to the lead. Can he hold off Dale Earnhardt? We'll be right back. throughout the race that this is the Valleydale 500 and uh, perhaps some of you are wondering who or what is Valleydale and uh, Benny it's a meat packing and processing company. Exactly right it's here it's home office and its plant is here in Bristol and for the past three or four years they've been sponsoring this race bringing some of their customers in and the VIP lounges and it's worked very well for them and believe me it works very well for us the race fraternity. Now the leaders begin to move into heavy traffic once again as they come down the straightaway. They both move to the outside and pass Clark Wire, and they pass Don Hume, who has recovered from his spin and is uh, back out there on the racetrack. Now they approach Bill Elliott and Rusty Wallace. Wallace running in fifth position. Three laps down. Clark Dwyer, car number 64. Is as you can see battling alongside Don Hume. Clark is from Colorado Springs, California. This is the Elmo Langley car, and he has competed in all four previous Grand National starts this year. Was 18th in both the Daytona 500 and the Richmond 400, 37th at Rockingham, and 20th at Atlanta. He's 21 years of age, and unofficially we have him in 14th spot. This is his uh, second or third year on the on the circuit, and looks to be going to be a pretty good race car driver down the road. A little experience. He's persevered here this afternoon. Uh, several of the rookies and less experienced drivers are still out there on the racetrack simply because they uh, stay out of everybody that's else's right. way. Sure out of trouble, that's for sure. Terry Labonte has been making some tremendous progress catching Buddy Baker in the last few laps. It looks like there's going to be a contest for third spot before this thing's over. We only have 28 laps to go, but I think that Lebon is going to be able to catch him before the thing is over. You know, Earnhardt looks like, Bob, that he's out of it. Yeah. You know, he'll, uh, Rudd will get a 10 or 15 car advantage and you say, well, there goes Earnhardt. But you know what? You look up the next minute and Earnhardt's two or three car lengths behind him. Uh, I don't know where he's finding it, but he keeps coming back, keeps coming back. Well, it's certainly not a race to leave your time, believe me, because it could very well be with five laps to go or ten laps to go. Dale says, hey, I don't care if we have I have power steering or not, and I don't care if uh, this thing goes all the way. I'm going to go for the win. That's exactly right. And look, he's back again. Only a few car lengths behind. There's trouble coming off turn two. And Don Hume spins off of turn two. Slow down and stay behind. We have a caution period and it's going to be a race back to the yellow flag here on the straightaway. Ricky Rudd is going to maintain the lead, but it gives Dale Earnhardt some more rest time. That's right. I tell you what, 24 laps to go. Earnhardt can do it. Yeah. I think with the rest, with the adrenaline, I think Earnhardt can do it if 
his car is capable. Ricky Rudd might have something left too, Bob. We never know. That's true. This is our 15th caution of the afternoon, and this is a very important caution because uh, probably uh, we can go the rest of the distance now without a caution. Here come the leaders into the pits, by the way, and this is an important situation because whoever gets out onto the track first could uh, very well keep the lead the rest of the way. We'll watch it closely. Good strategy. Good strategy. Let's go down to Jackaroo. We're down here in the Wrangler pits of the second place machine, Dale Earnhardt. Dale is just sitting placidly in the car, and he just gasps it going back out. You can oh. hear it. A real quick stop for Earnhardt. We'll have to see if he beat his nemesis, though, the 15 car Ricky Rudd. I would say that those stops didn't vary more than two tenths of a second. They were exactly the same. But the big thing is that the Ricky Rudd automobile changed right sides. Dale Earnhardt changed left sides. Uh -huh. Now, before the tire change rule, uh, that would change all of both cars would have changed right. four tires. Exactly. So it really didn't make any difference. But now why did Bud change rights and why did Richard Childers change left? Mm -hmm. Big difference. Yep. Huh? Very interesting situation develops and we're going to go back green here in just a moment. But before we do, we'll take this break with back with more of the Valleydale 500 in a moment. Abreast formation on the back stretch, and we anticipate a green flag this next time around. We'll see who gets the jump off of corner number four. We only have 22 more laps to go, and this could be a battle to the end. Ricky Rudd and Dale Earnhardt lead him down. Rudd with the advantage. Earnhardt, though, right on his back bumper as they head down the back stretch. And Terry Labonte has past Buddy Baker for third spot. So last year's Winston Cup champion, despite the fact that he's two laps down, is back in third place. Earnhardt goes way high on the racetrack, gets the car a little bit sideways, and Ricky Rudd, oh, and they <laughs> bump going into turn number three. Well, at least Dale is telling Ricky that he's back there. Yeah, he knows it. Believe me, he knows it. Well, he, I don't know. He felt it. <laughs> <laughs> now Earnhardt pulling alongside of Rudd down the back stretch. Let's see who gets into the corner first. It is Earnhardt with the advantage. Although it comes Ricky back. Rudd comes back. They cross the line, and Earnhardt is a slightly sideways, and Rudd leads that lap. This could be the situation through the rest of the race now they with touch 18 again. to go. They're touching as they come off the second corner. This is just like Friday night at the uh, old dirt track. They're bumping and carrying on and trying to win this race. Earnhardt, though, has passed Ricky Rudd. And now we'll see if Earnhardt can stretch out the lead. I believe he's doing it. He's a couple of car lengths ahead of Ricky right now. 184 laps will be completed across the stripe. There it is. Labonte is in third. Baker is in fourth. And Rusty Wallace is in fifth position. Let's throw it down to Jackie Arute, who can answer the question that you and I talked about, Benny, about the change of tires at last pit stop. Jack? Well, well, Bob, I can answer it as far as Richard Childress is concerned. And you saw it when he passed Ricky Rudd, when Dale Earnhardt passed him. They elected to go for the left side tires because Childress said they weren't getting a sufficient bite coming up out of the hole, out of the corners. They thought if they went to the left, they could accomplish that beat and take the lead. And indeed, that's what's occurred. All right. That is an answer to that question. Well, Benny, uh, is your opinion any different at this point? Can Dale hold him off? Yes, he can. He only has 14 laps to go. He certainly can hold him off from here. And it looks like the strategy with rights to lefts, which one was the correct side to change, it really looks like the left side was the side to change because Earnhardt is sticking much better now than he was for the last 200 laps. This will be Dale's third win, by the way, here at this racetrack. He hasn't won since 1980, but he won uh, in 1979, the Southeastern 500, and won this race in 1980. He's also had a few second place finishes, but this will be Dale's third win if he can hold on. And it would be Ricky Rudd's first win here at Bristol. He has had uh, second place finishes on two occasions, but has never visited Victory Lane at Bristol International. 
the advantage to almost a half a straightaway as we have 11 laps to go. So Earnhardt is looking very good here in the closing stages of this race. It's been one of the most interesting Grand National races that I have experienced because of all the accidents that we have had and because of all the what you would think of as top contenders who were eliminated from the possibility of a win very, very early. We'll be back with the final 10 laps. That's what they're going after. Will it be Earnhardt Rudd or somebody else? Come right back with us. Bristol International Raceway in Bristol, Tennessee, where the Valleydale 500 has eight, make that seven and one half laps to go. The leader is Dale Earnhardt. Second position is Ricky Rudd, and there they are on your screen. You can see the advantage that Earnhardt has as he crosses the line. This will be Dale Earnhardt's second win of 1985 if he can hold on. He won the Richmond 400 on the half mile racetrack. Aside from that, he has had a ninth place finish at Atlanta, a tenth at Rockingham, and a 32nd at Daytona. Dale Earnhardt from Kannapolis, North Carolina, the Wrangler Chevrolet in the lead. And there is Ricky Rudd running in second position. When they come around, there will be five more laps to go. Looks like the lead is about stabilized. He doesn't have to lap him right now. He's got to do is stay in front of him. And I think that's what he's concerned with. The interval continues to stretch out just a little bit. Four and a half laps to go. Earnhardt in turn number three. And Ricky Rudd is way up by the guardrail in turn number three. That car getting a little bit wide and losing even more ground to the leader, Dale Earnhardt. Well, it looks, I think Rudd has gained a few car lengths, and I think he can see that he's gained a car length or two. And he really is trying right now because he still wants to win the thing. There's four laps to go, three laps to go now as, as Dale Earnhardt comes down from across the start finish line. But he really, he still wants to win this thing and still thinks he can. Well, we'll see. I personally don't think he can, but uh, we will answer that question in just a matter of moments. Earnhardt will have to pass a slower car here in the next few seconds as Jimmy Means in car number 52 pulls to the inside of the racetrack. In fact, goes even down on the apron as he is aware of the fact that the Rangers are approaching him and he needs to get out of the way to make sure that he doesn't bother them in any way. The white flag will come out this time around from Harold Kinder. And there is the one more lap to go signal for Dale Earnhardt. He moves the car into turn one. Keeps it in the middle of the racetrack through turn two and on to the backstretch. Ricky Rudd still several car lengths behind. There's clear sailing for Dale Earnhardt. He comes off of the fourth corner. The checkered flag is out. Dale Earnhardt wins the Valley Dale 500. Second place is Ricky Rudd. And third spot is going to go to Terry Labonte. Dale Earnhardt has never in his life been as glad to see the race go the race finishes this there's the fourth place finisher, Buddy Baker. And fifth will unofficially go to Rusty Wallace, last year's Rookie of the Year. So Rudd pulls alongside Dale Earnhardt and offers his congratulations. Dale will move into the pit area and will move into victory lane for uh, his winter interview, which we'll have in just a moment. Earnhardt led 213 of the 500 laps. Back with the winter interview in a moment. Did run in again, didn't it? Yep. Okay, we have sponsorship on this here. Excuse me.
Second, Terry Labonte, third, fourth to Buddy Baker, and fifth to Rusty Wallace. We'll be in Victor Lane in a moment from Victor International Race Lady. This is MRN, the Motor Racing Network. More of those guys on radio. Something else. Yeah, well, Dennis. Well, we're going to make that planer, aren't we? Come on, Earnhardt, get over there. Sorry. We going to get anything with Ricky Rudd? Okay. We going to get anything with Ricky Rudd? Should. Never to Bell, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, you're over modulating considerably, but we hear you. Nobody could hear me before when I was standing here for laps 460 to 490, though. Huh. Okay. Fourteen cautions for how many laps, Ken? Where do you guys want me to go? Say it again. I said, were there times Almost when you wondered if you could make it 500 laps? Caution. Yeah, we had asked Earl. Okay, it's Jackie and Victory Lane, not Larry. Okay. I'm on the out. There we go. Okay, we're about ready whenever you are, guys. They're done. We're right here. All right. All right. Every time I okay. do a TV right. show, you win this Do we need to do the billboard after the interview? thought I was going to need old Darrell. Okay. All right. Okay. Dale Earnhardt has survived an interesting race here in Bristol, Tennessee, and has won the Valleydale 500. The Winner's Circle interview is brought to you by Goodyear. Goodyear tires and Goodyear service for more good years in your car. Here is Jack Aroot. Well, da well, Dale Earnhardt, you had a little bit for everybody today. First of all, congratulations on a fine, fine win. Thank you, Jack. You know, this Wrangler bus, they work off a hard... Uh, Richard and all the guys worked really hard on preparing this car, same car we won Richmond with, and you know everything worked just just super today except the fire steering. It it went out about 100 laps into the race, and I ran the last 400 laps without fire steering. But the car still handled real well, even though it didn't have fire steering. It's just a little hard to turn. Uh, my arms kept going to sleep from you know tugging on it all the time. But uh, we made out. Uh, Ricky is real tough all day. You know, at the end we we raced pretty hard. Uh, 
that last stop, he got new rights and we got new lifts. And I think that's what made the difference because we had a left rear blister that was tore up because of the way I was running the car. Did you give any input as to the choice of tires on that last pit stop? Well, we changed rights before, so the less was the way to go, and the car usually picked up when we put on less. And, uh, you know, the tire that uh, we had problems with, it was, comes from where I slid it through the corner at one time, and uh, I told Richard it didn't drive right ever since then. So, you know, I punished the tire real hard sideways down there when I got knocked sideways that one time. And, you know, we just had to suffer on through until we caught that caution and uh, changed less. I don't think I could have beat Ricky until we got that caution. The main question, though, is would you want to do another 500 laps here without power steering? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Well, that's the story from a very jubilant victory lane. Dale Earnhardt, Richard Childress, and the entire Wrangler crew. And right now, let's go back up topside with Bob Jenkins. And our congratulations to everybody involved in the win. The average speed of the race, as you saw, was 81.790 miles an hour.